Good evening. I would like to call to order the meeting of the Board of Education of Baltimore County for Tuesday, August 30th. We will all rise and recite the Pledge of Allegiance to be led by Ryan Schwink and Miguel Acosta of Boy Scout Troop 130 in Perry Hall. We will remain standing for a moment of silent meditation in me memory of those who have served education in Baltimore County. All right, will you please join me for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Our first agenda item for this evening's meeting is our agenda. Are there any additions or changes to tonight's agenda, Dr. Dance? There are none. Sorry. Hearing none, is there a motion to adopt the agenda? Mr. Chairman, I'd like to make a motion that we change the order so that we address the um, policy first before the budget. All right, there's a motion. Is there a second? Yeah, I'm, I would be happy to second that motion. All right. Um, any discussion at this time? A motion and second? All, all in favor, please. Wait a minute, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I think, I assume Ann had something to say briefly as to why she made the motion. Yes. I was being courteous to give her a second. Okay. Well, I think that the two items are actually related in a lot of ways, and I think if, if we address the um, heat closure policy, that'll help us um, when we look at the budget and some of the items on the budget. I, I seconded the motion both out of courtesy but also, Mr. Uh, Chairman, because I think it probably does make sense to, uh, to review that policy first. I mean, most, uh, most of the folks are here about that, I suspect. Um, I know that, uh, I know, I don't know, but I suspect also that most of our friends in the media are here about that. And um, they operate on deadlines for their, for their shows. And since I was interviewed by several of them, I want to make sure I'm on TV. No, <laughs> seriously. That's a joke, people. That's a joke. Seri seriously, I just think uh, probably mo more of the people are here, but maybe not. They might. Be, I mean, I know a lot of people from Northeast are here probably because we got a lot of emails about Perry Hall Middle School. But um, I just think it would make more sense to to discuss the policy, which is the major issue, first. But it's, it's not right. that big a deal. All right. Any other discussion? Uh, if not, um, all in favor of changing the agenda, uh, please raise your hand. Those opposed? Okay. All right. So we'll keep the agenda as uh, print as scheduled. <clears throat> Our uh, next agenda item will be public comment. Sign up cards were available to the public prior to the meeting for anyone wishing to speak at this evening's meeting. Board practice limits the number of speakers to 10. Each speaker is allotted three minutes to discuss his or her issue. The completed sign-up cards for this evening have been placed in the box to my right, and the first 10 drawn from the box will be our speakers for tonight. If fewer than 10 sign-up cards are received, all who sign up will be permitted to speak. First speaker is Mike Bowler. Two. Second speaker is Bosch Ferron. Three. Third speaker is Lisa Garrix. Four. Fourth speaker is Lily Rowe. Number five is Jim Melia. Six, Six Linda Herka. Seven. Seven, Odell Lewis. Eight, Eight Michelle Notaro. Nine. Nine, Sherry Schaefer, and 10, Abby Baton. Thank you very much. We will now hear from those selected to speak during our public comment portion. This is the one opportunity we provide to hear the views and receive the advice of community members. The members of the board appreciate hearing from interested citizens and will take your comments into consideration. Even though it is not our practice to take action at this time on issues which are raised. When appropriate, we will refer your concerns to the superintendent for follow-up by his staff. 
While we encourage public input on policy, programs, and practices within the purview of this board and school system, this is not the proper avenue to address specific student or employee matters or to comment on matters that do not relate to public education in Baltimore County. We encourage everyone to utilize existing avenues of redress for complaints. I would like to remind the public that inappropriate personal remarks or other be behavior that disrupts or interferes with the conduct of this meeting are out of order. I ask you to observe the timer, which will let you know when your time is up. Please conclude your remarks when you hear the bell or see that time has expired. The microphones will be turned off at the end of the allotted time. Thank you. Our first speaker, then, is Mr. Mike Bowler, familiar face to us here on the board. Yes, sir. Unless you want to sit up here. <laughs> <laughs> I want to thank you very much for drawing my name first. <laughs> Actually, I'm here to uh, mainly to uh, make a comment, uh, make a compliment to the staff and the school board for the uh, opening of the uh, two new schools in uh, Southwest, in uh, District 1, Southwest Baltimore County. Uh, I was in Catonsville, the old Catonsville Elementary School the day it closed for students. Was there, took a picture of the last closing announcement. And so I had to go over for the opening uh, last week. I want to tell you, that that school was finished and that it's so wonderful. It's just an absolute tribute to the staff of this system. I mean, I drove in front, I drove down Bloomsbury 20 times during the summer. Every time I said to myself, it's never gonna open on time, <laughs> or to whoever was in the car with me. Something happened that last week. I mean, I think your staff spent 24 seven, I know the contractor spent 24 seven in there and it is a palace. It is. It is so beautiful, and there's a whole new, I don't know if the board knows this, but there's a whole new generation of schools, particularly elementary schools, that have all the bells and whistles, mm. stuff that I never dreamed of when I was going to elementary school in the 40s and early 50s. And this, then today I went, George Moniotis, a former board member, and I went to uh, West Town, and similar there, I had been, that's one of the first schools I visited when I was on the board, and it, it was a dump, frankly. <laughs> And it still has a lot of work to be done outside. But again, it's just spectacular. I mean, <laughs> Wi-Fi in every room. They have an outdoor classroom on the second level with uh, plantings around the outside. <laughs> and mm. They have faculty lounges on two floors, two separate faculty lounges. They have a room just for professional development. They have a room for uh, special needs kids, just, just for those kids, I mean, and, and big rooms and wonderful colors in both schools. And also they let the faculty and staff in both schools uh, have a say in, in color schemes and so on, reducing a class three classroom configuration to two, for example, that kind of thing. So I haven't been to the new uh, addition at, uh, at Westchester yet, but uh, George and I were just, we were just thrilled. So I wanted to say that and I wanted to compliment the staff for that. I also wanted to very briefly address the two issues that you uh, apparently are going to, well, one issue that you've recently taken care of or voted on. I hope you'll re return to the, uh, uh, to the uh, Muslim holidays issue. I think that was a bad vote. I think uh, the board all right, that's it. All right, thank you. And I hope you'll redo the uh, closing policy tonight, the air conditioning closing policy tonight. Thank you, Mr. Bowler, very much. Okay, thank you. Our next speaker is Dr. Bosch Farone. Mm -hmm. Good evening, board members. Good evening. I have been injured by the heat in the school system. Thank you all for um, voting on the eight holidays last week. I think all of you has made history. 
special ones I mentioned today that made history is Miss Eaton. Miss Eaton voted against the Eid because he does not, she does not believe in any holidays. The question is, why reject the Eid holiday and support Yom Kippur and Rosh Hashanah if you are really truly against holidays? The second one is, you know, my admiration to Ms. Ann Miller for all the energy that you brought to the Board of Education. However, knowing you, I think it could have been different where the Board would have approved the Eid holidays, and you still could have referred the issue to the PRC to address all the holidays. Um, I think the problem is, the problem is bias. And as an adult, I know it's difficult to change. I know that a vote of six to five represents how much bias there is in this nation. And I know a vote five to six represents how much hope, vision, diversity, inclusion in every one of you that has worked with me on the issue of equality and equity in relation to the holidays. So in my limited time, I really ask those board members who has concerns not to really be afraid to address it with me. I am here for you as much as you are here for all of us. I have not really heard, for instance, from people whom I really admire a whole lot, like Mr. Gillis, Ms. Bratt, about the issue, about the concerns. And it's, it has been a shock to me to see that the position was negative when I addressed the issue umpteen times, 11 years, including the concerns. So as far as schools concerns, it's too hot. The schools are too old. And the school starts too early. And we as school board, if we deny Muslim citizens, legal citizens, their aid, I think we should really open the schools on Yom Kippur and Rosh Hashanah and really spare all the headaches associated with the PRC addressing the issue and bringing it in here. You can close and you can open. It is really your choice. And you know exactly what I'm saying. Thank you. Thank you. Our ne next speaker is Lisa Garriquez. It's Lisa Garrix. Oh, Garrix? I'm you. sorry. Thank you. It's quite all right. Um, members of the board, honored guests, and visitors. As a concerned parent and an active PTA member in the Perry Hall area for the past 16 years, I implore you to include funding for the design phase of a new Northeast Area Middle School in the FY18 capital budget. The overcrowding at Perry Hall Middle School must be alleviated as soon as possible. The school opened the year with enrollment exceeding projections and continuing to grow. While the school administration and BCPS have begun implementing measures to address the current conditions, to include additional administrators and teachers, more lockers, portable learning cottages, and other measures, these provide only a partial solution. There are multiple floating teachers without classrooms. Some students do not have regular or gym lockers. Class sizes are huge, averaging 28 students with some nearing 40 students. Even with four lunch shifts beginning at 10, 10 a.m., the cafeteria is at or beyond capacity and cannot accommodate over 1,800 students and nearly 200 staff members. With the projected growth in enrollment continuing over the next several years, planning and budgeting for a long-term solution must begin now in order for school construction to occur within a three to five year window following design and planning in 2018. And while our local councilman has proposed downzoning multiple properties within our district to help ease development, this alone will not be sufficient to address overcrowding issues in our Northeast area. I ask you to please seriously consider the inclusion of design funding for a new Northeast Area Middle School while formulating the FY18 capital budget. Thank you. Thank you.
Our next speaker is Ms. Lily, Lily Rowe. Hi. Um, you know where I stand on the heat closure policy, and I support the current heat closure policy, but I'd uh, like to offer up a different way of thinking about both the heat problem and our facilities problem. We have a number of schools who are looking for brand new buildings. That installs central air conditioning when you build a brand new building. If you accelerate the AC plan, it sucks up all the money there is. And there will not be money to build new schools. And if you were to put portable AC into the current buildings which can accommodate it, it would make available three, four hundred million dollars that could be used to build new schools. And you could build new schools over the next few years and install central AC, and it would take a little longer. But if the portable AC removes the emergency problem of heat in schools, then all of a sudden it's not necessary to suck up hundreds of millions of dollars for an emergency that can be solved with 10 million. And then you have the money to build all the new schools we need to build instead of doing renovations that are completely inefficient for the needs of the communities. Most of these renovations that are planned in these schools don't want the renovations. They need a new school. They know their buildings. They know that when you scrap all the plumbing and you have half a wing sinking into a lake and you know, the pictures that we see on the Equitable Facilities Facebook group from all these different schools just leads me strongly to believe that the best investment for the county is to build new schools. And the way to free up the most funding to do that and to solve our heat closure problem is to put in portable AC, free up cash flow, build new schools. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jim Malia. I'm not sure if I pronounced your last name right. Or. Thank you. All right. Thank you. And um, thank you to the board for the tough job you do of addressing the heat closure policy. And uh, the reason, part of the reason why we're having this is because the, the board was bold enough to address it. And uh, you're looking at revising uh, that policy tonight. Um, <clears throat> I currently work at Lansdowne High School, a school without AC. Uh, we need our students in our classrooms, and I'm not sure what to do about this issue because I work in a building with a brick, brick exterior um, that cooks the inside of the building. We have new $10 million windows installed that uh, ventilate on the bottom panel only, and it gets hot in there. It was 90 degrees in one of our classrooms this morning. So, we need our students in school, um, but the conditions are still rough. And it reminds us uh, of the Lansdowne High School, this facility, uh, that needs major investment, as Lily was talking about, uh, into this infrastructure to deliver a building that's equitable with, with other high schools in the county. Uh, and I noticed that in the, the capital budget tonight, is a request to the state for, um, for renovation. And it looks like that's the direction that the board is, is planning to go. And if, and if that is the case, uh, I hope our school comes up with, with uh, a building that is equitable. Um, for instance, with the training I did at Dundalk, uh, it was a beautiful building, beautiful rooms, and uh, our students at Lansdowne deserve the same. I'd like to comment on one other thing, um, another inequity that Lansdowne High School students experienced this week, and it was athletics. And although our building is not air conditioned, none of the football fields in the county, I believe, are also air conditioned. But while these other athletes were out practicing, our students uh, were not allowed to practice. And uh, under the auspices of the athletic director, the coaches on separate contracts, I'm not sure what all the legal ins and outs are of the athletic programs, but I do know this, that some of our starting football players 
will be on the sidelines because they don't have 10 practices, that we will be playing against a team that has three other practices that our student, student athletes did not. And that's just the football team. It's not the field hockey team, the cross country team, and all the other student athletes that I've had conversations with uh, today, including today, uh, that were not able to practice. So please consider at least an addendum to the heat policy that, um, that allows our athletes to practice. Thank you again. Thank you. Our next speaker is Linda Harka. Hello. Hello. Um, I put my thoughts on paper. Um, I need my glasses. After reading your grading guidelines for the 2016-2017 school year, I wanted to put, add my input. I am the mother of five from ages 15 to 33, and I've had two exchange students for several years. Our family has experience with the following schools, Pinewood, Ridgely, Delaney, Baltimore Lutheran, Calvert Hall, Loyola, and St. Paul School for Girls. In all these years, I don't believe I've ever contacted the Baltimore School Board before, and now within one week, this is my second time. The first is regarding the attendance policy due to heat. And I did send an email yesterday that this, the mornings have been very cool. There's no reason our kids can't go to school in the mornings. Um, uh, uh, back to my other issue. According to the policy 5210, the board has stated the following. Learning is our core purpose. Although I would agree that this is a primary objective, it is equally as important to facilitate character development in our students. When behavior, attendance, and homework are not used to calculate grades, we teach our children that the most important thing is the grade alone, and we dismantle character development and personal responsibility. A grade needs to incorporate the entirety, and that will involve some subjectivity on behalf of the teachers. And kids who don't test well, this is, uh, they will be failure in this system. Schools need to partner with parents, encouraging respect, motivation and effort. A smart kid who gets good grades and does not work hard does not encourage others, especially one that works really hard but doesn't have the same intellectual ability. Great effort in any situation can certainly yield successful people, other than in Baltimore County schools right now. This grading system actually discourages effort since it basically has no value reflected in the grade. So while learning is our core purpose in school, our ultimate goal should include developing a student's ability and passion to become respectful and successful adults. The concept that behavior and attendance are not used in calculating grades is very short-sighted. Employees who do not show up for work and have poor behavior, they get fired. Why would this not be taught in our schools? This is a primary differentiation between Baltimore County Public Schools and other school systems in Maryland. All too often, expectations set are expectations that are met. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Odell Lewis. Give me the opportunity to speak today. Uh, first of all, I would like to tell you that I end already. <laughs> You're, good. You're good. Okay. I am the proud parent of a freshman that attends Franklin High School, and he made the varsity football team this year, and I'm very proud of him. I applaud you all for the decision you've made in making the decision to not have students go to school in hot schools without air conditioning. But I think in making that decision, that you all have somewhat forgot about the student athletes that work very hard within this school. My son plays football, and they have not been able to practice certain days. And I know that this is probably a rule that we had on the books back when we thought about snow days, where if there's no school, then you can't practice. This is a very good football team, and they play some of the best 
schools in the state, very high caliber. We just had a scrimmage recently against Gilman and they beat Gilman in this scrimmage. And I can guarantee you that the students would not have been able to do so well had they not been able to practice. And I feel that some of these students that are at some of these schools that do not have air conditioning are at an inherent disadvantage. And if any of you parents know that have children that play football, it's a very dangerous sport. And I think these kids need to be out and have their practices so that when they do get the game time, we limit the injuries that they have and basically that they have fun because they are student athletes. And I think that's what's most important. So again, I do applaud your decision, but I also think that and hope that you guys make an addendum to that, to think about the student athletes that play golf and football and some of the other sports this fall, that they do want to get out there and they do want to work hard to be at their craft. The other suggestion that I have is I have a friend that is a, a, a teacher at a middle school, and even though that their school has air conditioning, her room does not have air conditioning. And therefore, because you have the days where it's hot and certain students don't have to go to school, her classroom is still full of kids in a hot room. And there's no policy in, in place where that if they're, and I may be mistaken, but there's no policy in place where if the school does have air and you're on one of these days, that the students can be moved to another area of that school that is, that is cool. So therefore, that the students do get the advantage of having air conditioning. Again, I want to thank you all, every one of you all, for giving me the opportunity to talk today. And go Franklin. <laughs> thank you. Our next speaker is Michelle Nataro. Hello, I am the mother of two students at Dundalk Elementary. Um, Dundalk Elementary was built in 1925 and has had very little to no upgrades done to it in the entire time. Um, the electrical system at DES is very old. It's <clears throat> almost as old as the school. We have sockets that spark and overload or overload the breaker causing it to trip if more than one thing is plugged into them. Um, and with all the wonderful technology that we have now, um, the outdated electrical system uh, just does not support them. <clears throat> when it's hot in the classroom, they have to make decisions about whether to plug in a fan to cool the room or use it for the technology. Uh, so we want to make sure that our school is still on the budget to have a new building built and open by 2019. And then as far as the new AC policy goes, I personally have mixed feelings about it. Um, I'm happy that our children are not suffering in the horrible heat. The building, especially the second floor, is extremely muggy and just blazing hot. Um, last Thursday, when I picked my six-year-old up from school, he literally looked like he had run his head underneath the water. And I actually started to ask him if he did. And then I looked around and realized that all the kids pretty much looked like that. So it was definitely a rough day for them. <clears throat> um, but at the same time, I don't think it's fair that they are missing out on their education. Um, our children are already at a disadvantage because they're forced to learn in the heat and the old building and overcrowded classrooms. And now they're missing school days, but will be held to the same expectations as the children in the air-conditioned schools. Um, last year, we had Home Depot willing to donate supplies for a do-it-yourself do air conditioning unit, um, but we were told that we were not allowed to. Uh, we were not allowed to do it. So I am just wondering how that is not a solution, um, something that wouldn't cost you any money or you know the county any money. So um, yeah, I would like to know why we can't do that. But all right, I guess that's it. <laughs> Thank you for your time and your consideration. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Sherry Schaefer. Hello. Hello. I'm Sherry Schaefer. I'm a mom of a child that goes to Dunlock Elementary School. Um, I want to first talk on the heat closure policy. While it 
it does have our children missing time at school, you put it in play for the safety of our kids. There's been nothing that has changed, I know in our school, to ensure the safety of my child sitting in a classroom that feels 127 degrees. That's what this real feel is, that's from her classroom. Nothing has changed, so why would you want to revise the policy to make my kid go back and sit in this classroom again for even longer? That, it's not safe. It, her sitting in a classroom with a real feel of 127, that's not safe for anybody. Not even the adults, not even the teachers. Um, the second thing I want to talk on was I wanted to make sure that we do get our school. We're in desperate need. Dunlock Elementary was built in 1925. Our plumbing is still original. We still have original plumbing. We have to tap in to lines outside to fix a water fountain, which by the way, is not. So it doesn't, it, it doesn't make sense with temperatures like this, water fountains like that, and water that comes out looking like that. A new school is a, is a given. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Our last speaker for the evening is Miss Abby Baton. Good evening, Chairman McDaniels and Vice Chairman Gillis, Dr. Dance, members of the board. Good evening. Since tonight's topic is the capital budget, my remarks are aimed at addressing that budget. For decades, Baltimore County ignored the infrastructure in our school system, as did many systems around Maryland and the country. We still hired teachers to teach, administrators to administer, but reduced the maintenance staff and left maintenance unable to address anything but the most pressing of needs in our schools. We forgot that in order to maintain our buildings, we had to perform preventive, preventative maintenance as well. We have been paying dearly for that underfunding process. The county executive has made this a priority in his administration and the county council worked in agreement and funded the school's capital budget requests. We have been very grateful for that initiative. However, we also need the governor to be a partner with Baltimore County by freeing up the state money we need in order to expedite the projects we have identified as well as those we have yet to identify. It is evident that we need our schools air conditioned as soon as possible. But that is not the entire picture. We still have several schools that are mostly air conditioned. There are areas within some schools that are not air conditioned, even though the schools are. Those areas are often the gymnasium and locker rooms. Imagine teaching sometimes more than 50 very active students in one gym, while the temperature in the gym without any bodies is already over 100 degrees. Now we add those 50 overheated bodies to the mix and the conditions become even more difficult. We can't go back to ignoring our infrastructure. The time to begin looking into our schools that may, have, uh, that may have areas that need to be air conditioned as well as schools whose air conditioners are aging and not reliable is now. Once all the schools that are non-air conditioned receive their air conditioning, we would be able to move much faster to ensure all schools are fully and consistently air conditioned if we start looking at that process now. I, for one, would like us to have no need of a heat policy as quickly as possible. Thank you. Thank you. Our next item for this evening's meeting is unfinished business. Uh, we'll review the FY 2018 capital budget. And for that, I'll call forth Mr. Smith and Mr. Saris. Good evening, gentlemen. Good evening, Chairman Daniels, Vice Chair Gillis, Dr. Dance, members of the board. I'm joined this evening with uh, myself as Pete Dixit, the Executive Director for our facilities, as well as George Saris, our Executive Director for Physical Services. Um, we're here tonight to continue the conversation of the work that is taking place for our FY18 state capital request. 
um, you have it before you now. The we've had several sessions to discuss um, the inclusion of the items we have here, the priority list that we have, and we've had discussion tonight from a host of community members about various projects that are within this this particular request here. We're continuing our efforts with both county and state funding agencies to make sure that our requests um, have the required information to continue to further the process. It's a fluid process. Um, we're going to go over a few questions that we have here related to um, questions that have come from the board at the last several um, meetings that we had and, and did not get addressed there. Um, the capital request now uh, is consists of 30 projects. I won't go through them individually, but they have 30 projects with the first 12 projects being the air condition projects as the accelerated process to get those um, air condition projects done sooner than the initial plan, followed by uh, the additional renovations, additions, and, um, and, and additions to our schools for roofs, new buildings, as well as renovations. With that being said, I want to turn it over to Mr. Dixit, who will go through uh, the questions that we have thus far, and then we'll yield the floor to the board for any questions that you may have that we can address. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, I'll quickly go over some of the questions that have been submitted to us. The first question pertained to the amendment for the Educational Facility Master Plan. Uh, as we explained earlier, uh, after the plan, the capital plan is approved by the board, we will submit all of the details, a big binder to the state, and review our plan with them. At that time, the amendments will be part of that submission. The next question is, if the additional funds, uh, how does the funds compare to what Dr. Lever anticipated? And really, there is no anticipation of amount from the state. Dr. Lever does not give us any idea of what our approvals, our uh, anticipated amount will be, except that what is the total uh, part of money that's available to all the 24 subdivisions. Uh, how does the 44.6 million being requested for Central Air Project match up with your timeline for County Executive May 18 budget announcement? The 44.6 million represent the state portion of the projected cost of 99.1 million. The county portion is 54.5 million, and <coughs> the total cost just for one project, for example, Kenwood High School, is $20.6 million. All of that information is available as part of the capital improvement plan. Lansdown, Delaney, Patapsco, and Woodlawn High Schools are still scheduled for limited renovation, and they are behind 81 million in higher priority request. Now, one thing needs to be clarified that while the uh, limited renovation is ter term is being used for state submission, the funds that county have given us a lot more than just for the limited renovation, and we are extremely thankful for that. Um, the county has agreed to forward fund the projects depending on our schedule and cash flow. Dundalk Elementary Community has been promised that a replacement school will be funded next year yet they are the third lowest priority, only ahead of two roof replacement. If no state funds are made available to meet our deadline, uh, of our ambitious timeline, the county has indicated that they will forward fund the project. In other words, the priority for Dundalk Elementary is still there, whether it is on the list or not, as soon as the design is completed, our intent is to start the Dundalk Elementary and all of the schools at that time. What is the status of central AC installation as Chase, Halstead, Kearney, Joppa View, and Villa Cresta Elementary School? All of the schools are completed as planned with the exception of Halstead, uh, which school is a few weeks behind because of the equipment delivery issues and is projected to be completed by September 9th. And, uh, the other thing is the 
IAC had rescinded $538 million in 2015 capital funding uh, for the Orem's elementary roof replacement project. And the response to that is that we had, uh, at that time, because of the uncertain future of Orem's elementary school, we had requested to rescind the project. The county has asked, working with the county, and that project will again be submitted. Um, and and, and the, 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 the county has agreed to fund the roof project in 2018. So the project will be done with all county funds, and, and, and county has, has given us funds for that. Uh, can you confirm that Dundalk, Bedford, Berkshire, and Colgate are included in the list of every remaining elementary and middle school? And this refers to air conditioning schedule that we have given, uh, given to you. Uh, these four schools will receive air conditioning when the new schools are completed. Uh, and the next question is, if not, how do you plan to provide a student teacher and staff at these schools safe classroom environment until replacement schools are built? For all of those schools, there are not air conditioned. We have ventilation system that will provide safety. It is only the temperature that won't be cold, but they, they meet all the safety standards now. Uh, I think I took care of this. The, given that high schools, these high schools will not have air conditioning until 2019, what steps are being considered to provide those students with a safe and comfortable environment? As I indicated, the schools have safe environment and their ventilation system is working. It is only the temperature issue that we are dealing with. I want to clarify that temperature doesn't necessarily mean that a school is unsafe. Those schools have been operating for a long time and they are safe schools. Comfort and safety are two separate issues. Uh, there's a question about Camp Field, Cape Newsel Alternative Center, and Rosedale. Uh, they are not scheduled to have air conditioning installed. And at this time, we are still reviewing the plans for the program. So that, that, that thing is out open there, and the program is being reviewed. And whatever the future will be, that will be incorporated as part of our air conditioning efforts. Uh, are the installation schedules contingent upon receiving more than 40 million in state funding? And the response is that county has agreed to forward fund all of our projects, all of our projects uh, to meet the timeline that we have shared with you. And that concludes all the questions that we have so far. All right. At this time, if there are any additional questions from the dais now, we'll be available to answer those questions or at least get the information back to you. All right. Are there other board member questions at this time? Ms. Miller? Yes, thank you. Um, are standalone central AC projects considered a renovation which would disqualify a school from state funding for, six, for 15 years? They are considered <clears throat> systemic renovation, so the, they will still qualify schools for state funding with the exception of air conditioning part. Okay. For 15 more years. And would installing portable AC disqualify a school from state funding for 15 years? Uh, portable air conditions were not part of state approved project so far, as far as I know. So that's about all I know at this time. So it would not disqualify a school from state funding? If we were to install portable air conditioner, mm -hmm. if there was power available, if they met all the environmental regulations, and if we are in compliance with every other thing, they will not, they in itself will not disqualify the project. But okay. there are a lot of ifs in there. So in neither of those options, would a school be automatically disqualified from state funding? Yes, but that is still, uh, uh, we have to look at that, the effective use of the funds for those projects. That, That's that, that question you're asking still has not been completely <laughs> fleshed out at the state level. So Mr. Dixon is speaking in reference to what may have been prior, but there has been a lot of discussion at the IAC as, uh, as it relates to what will be qualified and what, what is not qualified. So 
we don't want to speak on the behalf of the IEC, they can let you know that answer. But for us, that has not been our process before, and those funds have not been included in, that, in our request. So if, if, if that question is something that is being asked of the IAC, we can certainly assist in getting that, but we can't answer for the IAC or BPW. Okay. Um, yes. that is from the public school construction program from Dr. Uh, excuse me from David Lever dated July 14 2016 where it talks about new items and number one the Board of Public Works approved an amendment to the regulations for the administration of the public school construction program Comar 23.03.03.11 on May 11 that will allow window air conditioning units to be eligible for state funding after July 6 2016 window air conditioning units and associated electrical upgrades, installation and security in schools where more than half of classrooms are not temperature controlled. And there's more language. So perhaps I'll submit this to be included in the minutes and uh, people can have that in their minds in future discussions. Thank you. Um, what's the status of the forward funding request uh, as far as a reimbursement schedule from the state? I understand there was a meeting with the state just a few days ago. Is that right? I was not part of that meeting. The, the current status of Baltimore County's forward funding, the county has, in working with the superintendent, as well as the staff, has under, they understand the complexity of our capital requests, and we'll continue to work with our state funding agencies to garner as much resources as possible to help aid and assist the accelerated plan we have now. But as that's being determined or worked out during the various capital cycles at the state level, the county has agreed to forward fund to allow those dollars in lieu of those reimbursements until so that the projects can stay on the aggressive time schedule that we're on now. So that that is the commitment we have from the county executive and his team. I, I'm just concerned about what might be the result if we don't if the county does not receive uh, reimbursement from the state on whatever schedule that they are expecting. So is there a schedule that they're requesting reimbursement on? The, the schedule request for reimbursement is the normal process that we do every single year. It's based on your priority list and how the, the state cash flows those dollars. So um, whatever that dollar amount winds up being, it, it's just identifying the, the dollar amounts that Mr. Dixon alluded to, to the 44 some odd million dollars. That's just the state portion. It, it is not going to preclude the projects from being completed based on the commitment from our local funding agencies. It just will mean that when those dollars become available, it, it's a reallocation of the, of the funds that have been forward funded. If the state does not fund the central AC projects for FY18, will we be able to meet the installation schedule that the county executive laid out? The forward funding that we have now will indeed do that, regardless of the, the funding of the state comes sooner or later. It will, it will allow for that. So the answer is yes. Will it cause any of the other projects on this list to be delayed for an extra year or more if that funding doesn't come through? The commitment of the FY18 capital request has been fully uh, vetted with the county to include whatever funding that's come for the state. So that answer is yes, these projects will move forward and then the county will forward fund them as we move through the process. And the forward funding is only for this year. So if they forward fund this year's, but you know, it's going to be going on, these projects are going to be going on for several years. It's for what funding the, in it's for funding the projects that we have on the FY18 request. So these projects here are forward funded and there are additional air condition projects that will be presented on the next capital plan that are also included in that forward funding mix. So all of the AC projects will be completed with the forward funding that we have submitted here. And the, the renovations and other projects? The, these projects uh, are indeed on that forward funding schedule as well. Right, but just for FY18. So if, if they forward fund, I'm wondering what's going to happen FY19, FY20. 
I mean, the, the county doesn't have unlimited funding. I think the answer to Ms. Miller's question is all the projects will be completed that are listed on the FY18 yes, request. They will be completed. It, it takes several years for projects to be completed, but the county's going to afford fund so that all the projects will be completed. I, I'm sure they'll be completed. It's, uh, I'm wondering how it might push the schedule out. They will be completed on time. Why did Reisterstown Elementary fall off the replacement school list? And in general, what causes projects to fall off the project list? In, in the initial look at our projects, we were looking at enrollment as being one of the factors in that. In looking at our updated enrollment projections, and Dr. Brown, you know this, of course, better than I do, but in looking at the updated enrollment projections, we can solve projected overcrowding in the northern part of the northwest area with redistricting and some of the other projects as well. But that's why we accelerated the air conditioning at Rice Sale, because it no longer needs a replacement school due to overcrowding. Um, by my own calculations, and this is going to be just a, a ballpark, if we installed portable AC in the 12 schools that are listed um, now instead of the central AC, that would free up um, I calculated about $70 million. So if we spent the $11.5 million for portable AC, it would free up somewhere in the neighborhood of $70 million. Um, and that would allow uh, funding, that funding then to be used for other projects such as the design phase of a new Northeast Middle School and a replacement school for Reisterstown Elementary. Uh, do you have any comments on that? I do not. Dr. Dance? It's the administration's recommendation what's in front of you to install central air at the projects in front of you on your FY18 capital request. Um, are, uh, there are schools on this list that, um, as uh, Ms. Baton mentioned, that have partial AC but not in all the classrooms. Do you know about how many there are that are in that circumstance? We are assessing those particular buildings with the principals and the administrations from those schools to get a better hold of that. Um, it's it's, it's a pretty labor intensive because you've got to address all of the buildings that have that. So we're gathering that information as we speak. Okay. And have split system air handling units, uh, like what was installed at Lansdowne High in the computer rooms, um, being considered as both a short-term and potentially even part of the long-term solution? There are several methods of air conditioning. When we consider any space for air conditioning, we look at all possible options. We look at the cost, we look at the energy efficiency of the system, and we look at the, uh, the lifespan of that and how would it satisfy the need of that area. So yes, for some spaces, a split system are cost effective, but for an entire building it is not. And could they then potentially be part of a long-term solution? So they would solve both an immediate need and then also be part of the long-term solution? Yes, they could be part of the solution for certain specified space within the building like gym or uh, library. So all central AC or all portable it's not necessarily an all or nothing solution here. That there are there are if, variables. If the building is centrally air conditioned, but some part of the building is not centrally air conditioned, a split system is a viable option. But if the entire building is not air conditioned, then a split system for the entire building is not a cost effective option. Okay. And I'd like to ask Dr. Dance, uh, what is being done to secure the $10 million the state is holding back for portable AC? I think there will probably be some board members who know um, more information than I do on this one. However, what I would say is the f latest information we got is that the IEC has recommended that that $10 million be returned to Baltimore County. Um, my understanding is that there were still questions that the Board of Public Works were waiting on answers for. Is that... Is that the case? We've submitted information to the Board of Public Works, but again, there probably are several board members who might know more information than I know on that topic. Uh, but, but that request was submitted to BCPS administration. I just answered yes. We've submitted information to the Board of Public Works in terms of our timeline on air conditioning our projects. 
And there are still outstanding questions that they're still waiting on, is that the case? We have no outstanding requests from any government agency asking for information from Baltimore County. So you've answered all of the questions that they I submitted to I think my previous you. answer was yes, Ms. Miller. Um, and when will we have a definitive answer from uh, the state regarding the waiver for non-air-conditioned schools? We submit waiver requests to the state superintendent and to the Board of Ed at the end of every school year. So we won't know uh, until We wouldn't know June. right now what to ask for. We submit all of our waiver requests at the end of the school year because the State Board of Education has to approve district waivers. The state superintendent approves individual schools. Were there any discussions with the state um, regarding the likelihood of that waiver uh, being approved? I think that was reported in the media and I shared it with the board earlier that yes, I've had conversations with the state superintendent. I don't know if we're mixing the capital budget conversation with the next agenda item from the board, but yes, I've had previous conversations with the state superintendent. And did they lead you to believe that that would likely be approved? I would not have recommended to the board if I had not had conversations with the state superintendent. And so you're saying that they did lead you to believe that it would be approved? I don't know if I'm ask, answering the same question over, but I've had conversations with the state superintendent. And in those conversations, did they lead you to believe that they would approve the waiver? I think I've answered your question, Ms. Miller. No, I don't believe you did. Between the lines, you were having problems with it. Oh, just no reading. I just want a yes or no. Well, I think you have, you've had your answer about four times. If you can't read between the lines of what the superintendent says, um, you better reframe your question. Um, there were some, Ms. Miller, did you, uh, we, we can come back. We had some other board members that had some questions. If you want to Okay. I, I have some motions to make. Should we just do questions and then, then motions after? Um, yeah, if you, we would. Yeah, let's uh, let other members ask some questions. And yeah, as long as we'll get out. an opportunity to do that. Ms. Eaton. Hi. We've had several emails from the um, Northeast area, especially the Perry Hall area. Is there any money in the 2018 budget to help alleviate overcrowding at Perry Hall Middle? In the current request we have now, um, the Northeast is on the list for the 700 school except the Victory Villa schools, so they are represented here on this particular pl plan. However, the most recent request you have now for Perry Hall Middle is not represented on this particular FY18 capital request. It's in conversations, we've had conversations with both state and our local um, funding authorities about that that's a particular schools whose enrollment is, is growing and we're trying to make sure that we can include it as those growth projections continue to, to roll out. So is there hope that it could be put into the 2018 or no? At this to Ms. Eaton's question right now, there is no program county money for a middle school in the <clears throat> Northeast area. However, um, as Mr. Smith said, we are having conversations now around middle school enrollment in general in that area. Um, I would tell the board um, more than likely there would be a project on the FY19 capital request of four middle school seats in the Northeast area. Um, that's not necessarily a problem. If you look at Dundalk Elementary School, we're asking for planning and funding in the same time. So it's not unlikely, and we do it several times, where if we're asking for a project, we ask for planning and funding at the same time because the state does not fund for planning and or design. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, I had a, a question related to Ms. Eaton's. Um, about the Perry Hall area, and when we just completed the redistricting in the southwest area, uh, I know we left uh, Johnny Cake Elementary considerably overcrowded. Can you just make a comment? You know, we know the Perry Hall Middle School is a is a issue. Um, are there some other hot spots in terms of overcrowding that you know we should just kind of be aware of or consider? We're going to defer that to Mr. Brown, we want to stay in our particular sphere of what we do, so we don't want to uh, make sure that Mr. Brown can, uh, Dr. Brown can represent that question a little bit better than we can. So we are um, certainly looking at the northeast area. Um, we're, we are looking at the northeast area in particular. You have uh, two projects that are within this, and we will be coming forward with a series of boundary projects around the northeast to address overcrowding in that region. And. Um, Again, we know we left the southwest in a, in a question. Uh, again, as you look around the whole county, is, are there some other concerned areas other than the southwest uh, in terms of overcrowding that in the near term you can foresee some action needing 
to be taken? Well, we work with the county around these projects on, on a regular basis that you see the, um, in the county uh, executives, uh, Schools for Our Future plan, an outline of, of schools and the location of those schools is directly related to where we anticipate having overcrowding. And, and you sort of see the sequence of how we plan on addressing overcrowding over time in a combination of building projects and uh, redistricting. All right, thank you. Mr. Stewart. Dr. Brown, as a parochial question, can we just get a follow-up on the Johnny Cake specific? I, I know that that was an extreme example of an overcrowded situation, but we also have new schools like Relay that are gonna be opening up at capacity. Mm -hmm. So maybe we can just talk about that a little bit later as a board. Okay. All right. All right, Mr. Virch. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. At the last meeting, um, I'm the uh, board member comments. I uh, made mention specifically of the of uh, the overcrowding in the Perry Hall Middle School. Um, uh, really, uh, and you've heard uh, additional comments tonight. I want to thank the other board members uh, who also have been reading the emails. I want to thank the community for the the effort that they have. Uh, 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 put forth and continue to to uh, keep this issue very uh, very much in in the forefront of um, uh, future discussions about the area and improving education. Uh, Mr. Gillis, who also uh, who shares with me uh, representation in uh, the Northeast area, Mr. Gillis and I had an opportunity to briefly uh, speak. Uh, I made reference uh, at the last meeting that uh, the superintendent and I would be uh, meeting and talking about um, uh, North, uh, new Northeast Middle School um, uh, proposal. While I'm certainly not the arbiter of whether they'll, you know, whether and when and how it'll proceed. Um, well, this is a priority order list for FY 2018. Um, I don't feel uncomfortable saying that there is also a radar screen. And in terms of um, uh, the, this board, as evidenced by the comments, and of course BCPS personnel before us, you gentlemen included, it very much uh, is very much on the radar screen of folks' attention. And it's not going to be going away. It has to be addressed. And I know I'll be uh, advocating in, in its uh, behalf, as I'm sure uh, Mr. Gillis, uh, my uh, colleague, brother Gillis as I call him, in, uh, in the Northeast area. So I do appreciate uh, Dr. Brown um, giving us that, uh, that update tonight. Thank you. Any other uh, questions? If not, um, Ms. Oh, Ms. Causey. I actually, I had sent an email uh, last week with 16 questions um, that uh, several were not answered, so I'd like to just run down those. Um, when is the date that the board will have to vote on the fiscal year 18 capital request? This is scheduled for a vote at the September 13th board meeting. I'm just making notes since we don't get them in writing. Uh, can facilities planning provide the additional spreadsheets as they did in December that shows the total amounts to request in future years already requested and then received by project? To clarify that fiscal year 18 is only a, a part of what construction projects the total amounts will be. If you recall, it was either Mr. Saris or um, Mr. Dixit that provided the spreadsheet. So this one for the fiscal year um, 18, it, sh it shows the state funding, but it doesn't show for some of these projects what was done in the past, or am I misreading this compared to other spreadsheets that we received in the past? So is the total project cost on here for all of these? for each project? I want to make sure I understand your question. Are you saying that the cumulative total project cost, is, is that there? Yes. It was submitted on the original plan, so we don't, we don't have a rolling amount for, as that project gets to different phases, it lists the amount that's going to be a part of the capital request that is going to be in for that given year. So I think that answer is no, it doesn't have a rolling amount. Okay, so the rolling amount is not on there. We, uh, we, we certainly know what that is, but this is a spreadsheet that eventually is going to turn into a very, very, very long spreadsheet if we had all of those rolling totals there. So this might answer the uh, a little bit of Ms. Uh, Causey's question. At the end of every project, the board has asked for us to share with them the total project costs, any contingency amount that's left over. So that's been sort of our new standard of what the board has asked for. If the board wants something different, we would ask the board to give us direction. Okay, because... You, you all had done something similar for the last year 
that showed more uh, detail across the time, um, because I think it's important for all of the board to know what the total costs of the projects will be in terms of evaluating um, what's appropriate across the districts and for each school. So for Delaney High School, if you could just walk through, it's uh, line item number 25, limited renovation. Uh, it has the type of approval is for funding, yeah. and then it, <clears throat> the farm's 20 point. So this, could you, are those numbers the total numbers that will be state fund requests? This is the state portion of the request, $16.2 million. Out of that, when we break it down into cash flow, for fiscal 18, it will be $13 million, 13 million 30,000. And the balance of that, which is 3 million 182, that'll be part of fiscal two, 2019. And these numbers can be adjusted later on, but depending on our need. Okay. And so what then is the offsetting amount that is predicted right now would be the county's share? That number is not in this request. When we bring the county plan to you, you'll get to see that number. Which, which will be inclusive of both state and, and county. county. Okay. So um, is there a number already decided at, for, the, for the county's portion based on what the state will fund given that it's a limited renovation? We have approximate number for that, and, and that number evolves gradually. So at some later point, board will get to see that number also. Okay, so roughly what are you seeing right now is the county's portion that they would put forward for that project? The, um, I can give you an approximate number for any typical project. It's 35 to 40 percent is the state portion, and uh, anywhere from 60 to 65 percent is a county portion. But it dif differs from project to project. I just want to add that so that everybody understands, the county has already committed over $80 million to that, to the four high school renovations. So that's money that is essentially forward funded. I understand about the $80 million and the forward funding. Um, is there a, the, the bid process you said is going to start and then come back. Um, I've had conversations where perhaps it would be helpful to at the same time request, uh, not just for Delaney, but certainly for Delaney, um, a cost comparison between building a new school, which has lower construction costs than a renovation, um, and also the life cycle analysis that would indicate what efficiencies there would be in building a new school rather than continuing to heat and uh, eventually cool a building that was um, built rather awkwardly and uh, added on to and so forth with past architectural styles. Um, what would be the uh, pathway to, to present that or to uh, explore that option? Well, we can explore as many items as we want to, but there is a time factor involved. There are dollars involved. I do want board to know that we have tremendous number of projects here with the same staff. So depending on the direction I get from the superintendent, we'll analyze any option, anything. But we have to keep in mind that we have, at one time we are, uh, on one side we are analyzing options, spending time on that. On the other hand, we have tight timelines to meet within the limited funds that are available to us. I, I so think to I'll this point, uh, Mr. Dix, it, it's probably premature until you get your bids back. That's I think right. once you get your bids back and determine whatever the, the scope of work is and what the bids are saying that scope of work would cost, that's when you would want to do a cost comparison to figure out replacement versus a renovation. And I think um, the county administration has gone on record as saying that it wants us to do that once those bids, in fact, come back. My concern is that just lengthens the process of the decision-making, it lengthens the process of then the 
a decision which way to go, and if it is a replacement, then that's another planning phase, and there is no plan for cooling these schools while they are still waiting for the bid process. So it seems to me that it would make sense to do that analysis now to have that comparison sooner rather than later, because it seems to me that maybe uh, down the road, people will say, well, we're too far down the road to do an analysis now. So I'm going to uh, explore that, and I think it would be helpful if, um, if uh, the facility folks give us some guidance on that, and uh, hopefully we can have some discussions about that, Dr. Dance, um, because I know that there are several issues uh, with the renovations for these high schools, not just Delaney High School uh, with all of the issues that are wrong with it, uh, but also that it could be over capacity. And as the architect pointed out, there has been no discussion of how to uh, accommodate students once this renovation is done. Um, also, Patapsco has overcrowding issues. Lansdowne High has the issues of the settlement. And we did hear from the architects uh, about the technical engineer, geotechnical engineer, thank you, geotechnical engineer, who started a study, but it has not been conducted at the normal length of time. So there's still a concern, on my part at least, uh, that if we go down the road without having done an alternate evaluation, um, that these schools are not going to get what they need. And in the meantime, there is no plan for uh, any cooling that will um, allow them to stay in school. Um, so I, I have concerns about that, and I think that the um, I would ask the superintendent and the chair that the board uh, consider adding uh, some level of investigation to do that sooner rather than later, because it only makes sense to make decisions with our taxpayer dollars for the effective education for our children in the most efficient way and not just lengthen things out and end up making a poor decision. Thank you. Um, I'm not, I'm not done. Okay. Um, did you not receive the email with 16? Questions that I sent last week? That's what Mr. Dixit was answering at the very beginning. Uh, well, let's try this one. Um, please explain the process and project timeline of how central air conditioning will be retrofitted to schools during the school year. Is it a plan to move students to relocatable classrooms during asbestos removal, electrical upgrades, et cetera? How long will students be in relocatables, if that's the plan? And approximately how many more students will be in relocatables this year than last year? We'll use the similar process that we have used for the last eight schools that we did last year. We, yes, we need relocatables. Yes, we remove asbestos. Asbestos is removed during the time when the students are not there in the building and it is re removed uh, in compliance with all the federal regulations. Um, portable classrooms are provided based on the need, how many of them are needed, and it differs from school to school. So at the start of the project, the principal, the architect, and the contractor, they sit down together and they plan out the phasing, and phasing uh, explains exactly at what time how many students are going to be in which uh, relocatables? They come out of the classroom and go to the relocatable. It's part of our business on a regular basis. Right now, we are doing it in one of the middle school renovation, and we have done it in the past in Pikesville High School and all of the air conditioning projects. So it's a standard process. Okay, and so I guess one of my concerns is we had an issue last year with Reisterstown Elementary School where they had an influx of students after school started and they requested a additional relocatable classroom. And I know that Ms. Johnson and I went out to a PTA meeting there, I want to say November, um, and it turns out that that relocatable was not, uh, did not house the students until April. And there was, uh, you know, conversations along the way about getting permits and so forth. So I guess my concern is when we're starting this um, intensive project, you've mentioned you don't have additional staff and we've had issues in the past. How, what is different now in terms of how these projects are going to get done in time? We have done high schools. We have done eight elementary schools without a single problem. 
I don't anticipate any problem in the coming schools. I'm, I'm glad you don't. Yes. Uh, but I'm, I'm not convinced. Um, I've, I've asked for a number of questions. Please, please provide a last five-year comparison of capital construction funds requested, but then provide it by the state. Um, I also asked, what is the long-term plan to relieve overcrowding? Specifically, based on current plans, how many years will it take? Restate your question, please. What is the long-term plan to relieve overcrowding? Specifically, how many years will it take? Right now, we have a number of relocatable villages around the county um, for our students. We are now finding out Town Elementary School is not going to have an addition. So, you know, they are going to probably need another relocatable classroom indefinitely. Um, until some redistricting takes place, you know, that's a multi-year process. We already have some, some redistricting scheduled, correct? So how many years, what was, what's the total plan? So in December of every year, um, the board gets the updated um, student counts, which is our 10-year enrollment projections. Uh, we share with the board that information. We share any enrollment um, redistricting plans that we may have working in conjunction with the county that matches our state and our county request. So I think it's a little bit premature now as we are not necessarily even into our September 30th enrollment date right now to be able to comment on that. But in December, the board will get a report on our projected overcrowding or our projection for the next 10 years and our overcrowding plan. So you don't have a plan right now where you know how many years it will take to properly house all of the students in Baltimore County? Well, I think it's been publicly said that through Schools for Our Future, and the county exec said this, and I think we made a comment as well, that through the $1.3 billion campaign that would relieve all projected overcrowding that we know of now. But keep in mind, uh, right now, we are on pace right now to exceed our enrollment projections for just this year. So that's why we update that every year, and we'll update the board in December on any future overcrowding we have and how we may solve those. So what is the date in the schools for the future when the overcrowding will be? We anticipate to be able to finish those projects by 2021. 2021. Thank you very much. Um, and then the, the another question I had to kind of follow up with Ms. Miller is how will the forward funded projects be allocated over future years when we uh, submit a state capital request? Um, last year, I believe it ended up being $59 million worth of projects that were submitted, but then we received... 3940, right? So when you, when you're- 49 million. 49 million, thank you. So when the um, forward funding gets added to the state request on top of current projects that we're trying to accomplish for our students, projecting out how many years will it take to um, receive from the state the refunds that they're thinking they'll get, the counties will get how many years more? Because they don't give us everything we ask every year. The, the, the word refund sort of, we get, a, we get an allocation every year. That allocation typically ranges between 35 and 42 million. This last past, past year been slightly different because it came in a little bit around $49 million. There was a specific reason for that. That, that, that does not change unless the total state allocation changes, which is normally in the neighborhood of about $350 million statewide. If that number increases or decreases, that's what impacts what each individual locality gets. So um, the, the reimbursements or the allocation that goes to each LEA is based on the total annual funding from the state related to capital for that given year. So we won't know what that future is other than the fact that the county has f forward funded and has, has supported the capital requests we have now, now, depending on whatever allocation we get from the state, basing that allocation on the, the historical pass of the 35 to 42 million. If it's more, then it, it, it just makes the, pro it makes the state portion help aid what we're doing now, and it's less burden on the county. If not, the county covers that portion as we move along. So does that mean that the county will continue to fund construction at regular levels 
down the line, is there ever a time in the School for the Future plan or any other plan from the county funding side where there are not construction funds, capital construction funds available? I don't, I don't know if we can speak for what's going to happen in the future, but what we can say now is this capital plan that's been presented as well as the prior ones have been consistent with a funding model with the state and the, and the local. Any items that were not funded by the state, their portion gets funded. We've gotten the support from the local, so I, I don't want to speak too far out for what the county's. Thank you for that answer. I guess my concern is that as we vote on what's current, it is being based on what what will hap happen in the future. Um, and some of these schools, their future doesn't arrive until August 2021 for Colgate Elementary School, um, Dundalk Elementary School, August 2019. Um, so it is important in what we can count on in the future as we make these, those decisions today. Um, understanding about Reisertown Elementary School, I also had what if any other capacity projects are delayed? So Reisertown moved off of a addition list. Are there any other schools no. that have moved off of no. a project list? No. No. Thank you. Um, Please discuss when and any site improvements that will be budgeted for Delaney High School, including an improved bus loop, parking, athletic fields, and all the concerns raised by the Delaney community. That's the question. Those concerns have come forward. However, in the projects that are, they, that are presented now, the four high school projects, it does not include site work. That was shared at the time. That, that, that could certainly change as the bids come back, but currently it is not inclusive of any site work to fills, bus loops, or athletic, facility, athletic um, facilities. So what I'm hearing is there are additional needs that are around the county, but their, their needs are not prioritized yet. Is that correct? We heard about Johnny Cake Elementary School, which we heard quite a bit about during the redistricting. Um, I'm certainly aware of Delaney High School's issue. I know other people have raised other issues. So there are additional needs around the county, overcrowding, site development, uh, that are not on a plan yet that anywhere. Are, that are not on the FY18 state request. That is correct. Okay. And then for uh, current, because it ties in with the capital budget when we make decisions for the capital budget to apply money around the county there are some projects like Delaney's site improvements that uh, are not addressed so I'd like to understand how Delaney will be given adequate fields for sports given their almost 2,000 student population the neglected state of their fields and athletic facilities and the uh, information I've just received that it's not on a plan um, at all yet. Um, I was uh, informed just the other day that out of their 2,000 student population, they have 1,300 student athletes. So it's not an insignificant issue. And, and we're, we don't think that is an insignificant issue. However, at the current time, the, the renovation plans for the four high schools that, listen, that are listed here does not include the site work as it relates to bus loops, uh, athletic facilities of, of that nature, so it's not included. So it's something that we will continue to work with our funding agencies on to address moving forward, but it's not a part of this project currently. Well, in terms of what other um, fields are available, what other uh, park and rec fields are available, has Delaney, let me put it this way, I would like to request that there be an evaluation that Delaney is receiving the sports facilities that it needs in light of its current fields not being planned to be improved. Can I make that request, Dr. Dance? You and I can talk offline. I'm, I'm trying to understand your request, so I can, we can talk offline. Well, we understand that Delaney has 1,300 student, 1,300 student athletes. We understand that they have, the community has expressed concerns about the fields not being adequate, we've learned that it's not on a list to be evaluated, it's not on a list to receive funding. So I wanted to make sure in the meantime, in the indeterminate amount of time that they will not have their needs addressed, what can be done in the meantime? 
So we're currently right, working right now with Mike Sai, who's our athletic coordinator, and all the athletic directors at several of our high schools. It's important to keep in mind we have more needs than there are dollars. So we're talking about specific projects that are on the 18 capital request. But Perry Hall High School, which is our largest, deals with the same thing, even though they may have um, feels right now. Franklin High School, as you heard tonight, deal with the same thing. So we're working directly with the PTA president, with the principal at Delaney, to address our athletic needs, as we did with Carver. I'm just going to take a minute and look over my questions, if anyone else had questions. I just have an observation. Uh, my suggestion of last week that uh, much of this would be resolved if we would uh, support uh, increasing taxes, particularly in the Hereford zone. Miss <clears throat> um, Miller, I believe you had uh, a motion you wanted us to consider at this time. Yes. Um, I move to remove from the FY18 state capital budget request the request for funding for renovation of Lansdowne High School until a feasibility study and a life cycle analysis are conducted on the replacement school option. Okay. If, I, if I may, I think we're voting on the capital budget at our next meeting and, and motions such as that, as that should be at the voting session, not at the work session where there's discussions about the issues. Well, I'd like to second her motion. Maybe if you wanted to during the phrase it of make that evaluation available I don't know during the operating budget we made motions during the work sessions and then we just did the final vote well, on the on the final day could you um, I'm sorry could you restate your motion again I got um, I move to remove from the FY state capital budget request the request for funding for renovation of Lansdowne High School until a feasibility study and a life cycle analysis are conducted on the replacement school option. And that was seconded. Yes. Yeah. All right. Is there some discussion about that at this the, time? Well, well, I'd like to start uh, and, well, and speak on my let, motion. Let's, let Nick speak. Um, Nick has the Typically, floor. the person that makes the motion can speak on it first. No. no. Mr. Stewart has the floor. I won't take nearly as long as other board members tonight. I'll say I think that's a colossal mistake. I'll say for a number of reasons, but number one is losing Lansdowne's spot in line, I think, would be uh, a, a colossal mistake. I think that the county is already committed to reevaluating its options and its uh, plan when the bids do come back in early 2017. And I think the concern that was raised earlier about punting them to the back of the line uh, would be magnified by what you're proposing, which is to say, let's do hands off until we can try to rally around a different idea. Uh, I think it's, just, as a member who represents that area, I just think it does a, a colossal disservice. And I would encourage the board more strongly than I have on anything else to oppose that. Thank you. Any other uh, discussion on the motion? Ms. Eaton? I say if we do do that, I want to see a new middle school for Perry Hall put in in its place. Which is right. That's the point. Ms. Causey? I might make a suggestion that rather than uh, submit a motion to have it removed from its place in line, as Mr. Stewart has pointed out, that that we uh, that we could change it to a motion to have a life cycle to well, put we in. Have a, we have a, Mr. Chairman, we have a motion that's been seconded. Yeah. Uh, we have to dispose yes. of that motion first, don't we? Yes, don't we? we do. Yes, well, I'd like good. to hear the discussion, discussion that, that well, Ms. Not, Causey not, is bringing I'm up. I'm not promoting cutting off discussion, and I never do that. You know that. But uh, I'm just saying let's keep Stay order the here. Let's, let's try to move this forward, you know. All right, Ms. Cause, you have the floor for some discussion on this. Okay, so my so understanding Nick's point, which is valid, I believe, that we could, as a board, vote to have a um, what you propose done for the four projects um, in conjunction with their pro their processes and their state and, uh, and their um, their point in line. Well, why don't you? Let Maybe us we vote could on this motion and then make that motion. Wouldn't that be more sensible? 
sounds good to me. All okay, right. Well, why don't we do that? Yeah, um, Ms. Miller, you had some discussion. Yeah, I, I made the motion because the um, these studies have only been done on the <coughs> renovation option and never on the replacement option, uh, so that a com you know an informed comparison could be made. Uh, despite the fact that there has been a very large and vocal Lansdowne community that's been repeatedly asking for it. Um, any of us who have visited Lansdowne um, have seen the absolutely deplorable conditions that are there. And I agree with the outpouring from parents and teachers at Lansdowne who are asking for a replacement school. Um, I, I believe that renovation is likely a waste of a lot of money. And uh, I think we should get the studies on the replacement option to be sure we're proceeding down the right path. Uh, so it's not about rallying. The rallying has already occurred. It's about actually making an informed decision about with which pathway to proceed. Ms. Johnson. Um, last week we had a work session on the schematic or we had a schematic from from that school. I know that many of the issues were addressed with the music, um, the music wing, the sinkhole, and um, there's going to be follow-ups from that particular engineering company. Of that school, how much of that school, I don't remember, is being renovated percentage-wise? Lansdowne High School, the entire high school is being renovated. Okay. At, as in the other three projects, so all four are being completely renovated. Completely, 100%. Thank you. Right. I do want based, to Based on the funding that is available. We need, we need to make sure we, we have that conversation based on the funding that is currently available in the capital plan. Got it. I do want to share with the board that there is a deadline for state submission of this capital plan. That deadline is the first week of October. So if we don't submit it, then it will not be, it will not be eligible for fiscal 18 request. And all of the work that has been agreed with our uh, county partners is for the uh, for the renovation of the project. So uh, the funding approved so far from the county fiscal authorities are for the renovation based on the feasibility study that has been done. So if we start anything new, then we'll miss the timeline and the, for submission in fiscal 18. So just keep that in mind. Right, I, I am. I mean, the community there has been asking us not to proceed. So, uh, the fact that we would get out of line um, for funding for a renovation would uh, actually be in line with what's being asked by the Lansdowne community. Thank you, Thanks, so. Mr. Stewart. So uh, I want to say several things. One is, as Mr. Malia said tonight, uh, articulated it well, we need an equitable facility at Lansdowne High School, one that the community can be proud of, that's impressive, and that's what we're building towards. And the idea that people haven't considered a replacement or that conversation is not still happening as bids come back and the numbers are compared based off of what is real and what's actually happening, I think misses the mark entirely and is a not an accurate representation of what's actually happening in that community and the sophisticated discussion that's being led by people like Mr. Malia and so many others in that community who if you talk with uh, week after week who understand this issue have gone through the 120 page uh, studies produced from that school. That conversation is ongoing and again you know the suggestion that we would step out of line for anything I think is just a grand mistake of the highest caliber. All right, thank you. Uh, Ms. Eaton, did you have anything further? What was it called, Bloomsbury? Bloomsbury. Um, last year I went to um, Bloomsbury Community Center, which is now in Catonsville Elementary School, and that was um, renovated, and the place looks like a museum. I went there on the first day of school, and I could not believe that it was an elementary school. They did an excellent job renovating that uh, building. Thank you. Any further discussion? Yes, Ms. Causey. Uh, to your point, um, Ms. Eaton and I agree with you. Uh, that renovation was done by uh, gutting the building when there were no students in it. Uh, what's being proposed for both Delaney and Lansdowne and Woodlawn and Patapsco is a renovation while school is ongoing. And as a parent of two Hereford High School recent graduates who lived through a renovation in place, it is very disruptive to the teachers and the students. 
um, and it is in fact very dangerous. We had an incident where uh, HVAC equipment fell through the roof. Uh, a teacher luckily had left a classroom. It was after school hours, but of course we know our dedicated teachers stay after school and do a lot of work. Luckily, the teacher had left the room, but the HVAC equipment went through sprinkler systems, destroyed the piano room, the, the uh, water flooded all of the um, piano and the music room. It took quite a bit uh, to renovate that, and I was quite aware of it because one of my students was taking piano and all of a sudden no longer needed to practice because that class was essentially over. So while I agree that there can be renovations and they can turn out wonderful, um, it does have to be evaluated the total cost, the cost of moving the students back and forth, the cost of disruption to their education, and so forth. And th those are sorts of things that would be compared if you did a replacement versus a renovation in place comparison. And I don't believe that that's been done for any of those four high schools. All right. Um Mr. Collins and then Ms. Kathleen, do you think your children's education was shortchanged at Hereford because of the renovation? Do you think they are less prepared for where, they're, where they are now or what they're going on to do? I think it was much harder for them to achieve the same academic outcomes during that time frame. I mean, it was quite intrusive, and I'm not saying that it's not a good thing to do those things. I'm saying it's good to make a decision based on actual knowledge, actual research I know exactly of what you're choices. saying, but so, you're answering a question I didn't ask you. I, I, I asked you what time it is. I didn't ask you how to build a watch. So why don't you just answer my question? Do you think your children's educational program was shortchanged, and are they handicapped in moving forward with their lives because of the renovation that went on at Hereford while they were students there? They're doing well, thank you. Good. I rest my case. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Johnson? Well, just to add to that, I currently have a child in a high school that is being renovated at Pikesville High School. And past two years he's been there, and it has been, I would say, close to seamless. The um, entire portable buildings that you have outside, the school itself is, is beautiful, um, and I can't wait for everybody to come for the, for the ribbon cutting. This, the atmosphere in the school is different, and they didn't get a brand new school. They had a renovation, and it is remarkable to see just just what a renovation can do to change not just the body of the school, but the student body as well. Thank you, Ms. Johnson. Mr. Gillis? I'd like to suggest to the entire board um, that um, the practicality or the reality of this is that we're not a funding source and that our funding sources have already committed the dollars that are suggested on this capital budget plan. And if we are um, naive enough to think that uh, we can ignore or eliminate some of this and benefit our children, we are wrong. Thanks. Thank you. Ms. Miller, you had another comment? I'm wondering why we're all here then, if that's the case. Um, there are times to advocate, that's for sure. Yeah, uh, I think it's more, you know, we're here to more than advocate. We're here to actually make decisions and uh, direct uh, the school system. Well, Ann, we have a motion and seconded. Let's get to vote on it. <laughs> you know? Actually, I, I wasn't so even sure we were discussing my motion because I, I, I the, wasn't excuse either. Me, um, <laughs> You know, this isn't about whether or not renovations can turn out well. We all know renovations can turn out well. It doesn't mean that every project should be a renovation as opposed to a replacement. So the question is, I mean, what is the best way to go for this uh, when we're being told by the Lansdowne community uh, which way they would like to see it? We've all, or several of us, have looked at the building. Um, this is a lot of money that we're talking about. We don't want to pour money into an infrastructure that is uh, beyond, you know, beyond being re adequately renovated. Um, that would certainly be a waste, and that would certainly be a delay. You know, if we're talking about delays, we could spend years doing this and have to turn right around and replace that school. So um, the studies were not done on the 
uh, replacement option. I think we as a board should not approve this without having those studies. We're talking about a lot of money, a lot of time. Um, I would like to see those uh, studies first so that a true comparison could be made. All right. I think um, we have had allowed the opportunity. Did you have another comment, Mr. Birch? Well, I didn't have another. I just had one on this. Yes. Um, uh, my <laughs> friend Ann asked why we are here, and we're here because, as um, um, she said, she's made a motion. That's why we're here in, in an immediate sense. Uh, Mr. Uh, Stewart, uh, Nick. Uh, observed that this, he believes the motion, which he referred to as the hands-off, as a hands-off approach. I heard the other half of the motion, which is hands-off, don't fund. And while he used the term colossal, I think I would go with other uh, synonyms, huge, massive, gigantic, enormous, to characterize the mistake for a hands-off, don't fund motion that's before this board. Um, I uh, respect uh, Nick's familiarity with the community, and I also respect his judgment and his description of this motion. I think you can tell how I'll be voting. All right. Ms. Uh, Williams. I'd just like to echo that sometimes something is better than nothing, and sometimes something, something is better than everything. Um, I really want to see something done for these four schools. Um, they need it. And I... I want to see this happen. Yeah, this, Mr. My, my final comment, which would be that's exactly what we're talking about. We're talking about making progress and moving forward, but doing something for the community that's that's great. We're not going to vote tonight or vote on the 13th and then throw our hands in the air and say, well, we hope everything works out well. We're going to look at the bids as they come back. We're going to look at the feasibility of doing those things. We're going to question it inside and out. But we need to have something to compare it to. We need community input as we move forward. But we need to move forward. We can't parachute out of trying to make progress in Lansdowne and for the community. All right, thank you. We've had some good discussion, and we have a motion on the floor that's been second. At this time, I'm going to ask those uh, in favor of the motion on the floor to please raise your hand. All right, those opposed? Okay, the motion does not carry. All right, thank you. Yes. I move that board approval on the capital budget request be contingent upon the superintendent rigorously and immediately seeking the $10 million from the state for portable AC and reporting back to the board at each board meeting until that funding is either uh, secured or denied. All right. There's a motion. Is there a second? I'll, I'll second it out of courtesy. <clears throat> All right. Is there a discussion? I'd like to discuss. Yes. I think it's a bad idea. I think we should move forward. <laughs> I don't think it applies to this, and I think we should reject uh, the motion. Did you, okay. Thank you. Any other discussion? Uh, Ms. Miller. Yes. Um, as, as we discussed here tonight, um, solving the issue of air conditioning in our buildings is not an all one way or all another way solution. Uh, we want to have as many options open to us as possible. Um, it may make sense for some schools to uh, hold out for the central AC, especially if they're going to be renovated in the next year or two. Uh, and the others to proceed with uh, an immediate uh, uh, shorter term solution uh, to address the um, health and safety issues of our students and staff. Um, uh, many of these schools are not going to have central AC installed for several years. Uh, so this is a motion really to open up options for us. The state has offered us $10 million for portable AC. Uh, so we wouldn't have to go to the county for that. It's sitting there waiting. All we have to do is ask for it and answer the questions and present a plan. That gives another option doesn't say that we have to go down that road, 
but it opens up that option where right now we don't have the funding available because it was struck a line as a line item out of our um, operating budget request. Um, Mr. Collins? Yeah, very, very briefly. Uh, the issue of the $10 million is really a political fight between the governor and the county executive. And there's no one in this room that's more political in their whole life than I am. But as a board of education, I really do not believe we belong in the middle of a political fight. And I think that we should not uh, insert ourselves there. And if we start down this path, that's what we're doing. And I don't think we should do that. Um, as I say, I love political fights. I've spent my whole life in them. But, but as a member of the board, I think I should submerge my love for a political fight on either side and, and uh, not get into that. I think it's a bad idea for us to do that. And I think we should uh, defeat this motion um, and not go in that direction. Yes, Ms. Miller. Opening up the option of portable AC is no more a political, uh, inserting ourselves into a political fight than having the option for central AC. Um, just because that there is a some sort of political wrangling going on doesn't mean that we as a school system should not be pursuing air conditioning in our buildings. That's ridiculous. Of course we should, and we should uh, pursue it with for all options the money's there it's been offered it's a no-brainer it would alleviate immediately these concerns we're going to be discussing in a few minutes uh, the heat closure policy which is going to drive the point home even more that we need immediate relief let's allow that option that's all that we're trying to do here allow both options and then we can look and see which school does it make sense for which option and solve something. Let's solve the problem. We can solve it right now. We can vote and have that option open to us. Right now, we don't have the option. Thank you, Ms. Miller. I think um, the board members have come to an understanding of the issue. Um, we have a motion. It's been seconded. Um, Yes, Ms. I'm sorry, I was trying to get your attention. I didn't, I just have a quick. Okay. Um, whether this motion passes or not, it is important for us as board members to understand that we do have a role, and our role is to complete due diligence on each decision with the question, how is this going to best benefit the students? And if, in fact, this board does believe that it is important to protect the health and safety of our students and to provide equitable learning environments, then it would be appropriate for us to do the analysis of how are we going to run this school system for the next three to four years, five years, six years, until all schools are cooled equally. And it is quite clear from Anne Arundel County, who solved this issue 12 years ago with window portables, that it is not only possible, but it is probable, it is more immediate, it is less intrusive in the school phase in terms of not having to run duct work through ceilings that may or may not contain asbestos. So it is an important question, and, I, and we cannot sit here and vote week after week the status quo that allows certain decisions to be made without due diligence. And this is one of those issues. So why, while there are folks that are involved in how this looks politically and what it means to them politically, we need to not worry about what other people are doing politically and do what is appropriate for the students. And right now we have Right now, we have 27,000 students without air conditioning. Through August of 27, 
it's going to be 27,100. So it's 27,700 right now. Then in August of 2018, it drops down to about 12,000. That's making progress, but still 12,000 children. And that's not to mention the 500 teachers that go along with them. Then August of 2019, 8,400 students. Approximately, we, our population changes, and those <laughs> teachers, almost 400. August 2020, 1,738. Well, those poor souls, what are they doing? You know, wilting away while everyone else is studying for their advanced placement in a nice, cool room. Seriously. Um, through, and then 2021, 1,233. So it is an issue where there are people that have other considerations, but our consideration each and every vote, each and every time needs to be, is this the best answer for these students and the system? And as I pointed out with the, the relocatable classroom issue, with the fact that our staff has not been increased to ask to try and do this, this uh, you know, amazing work of installing all of these central air conditions in these schools, many of which uh, should be considered for replacement as their communities have, have come to us. Uh, so whether this motion approves or not, I do believe that we need to, as a board, as a system, as leadership, evaluate what are we going to do for these children to make sure they have an equitable, safe learning environment and not four and five years down the road. All right, um, Ms. Miller, would you state your motion again since we've been off this? I move that board approval on the capital budget request be contingent upon the superintendent rigorously and immediately seeking the $10 from the state for portable AC and report back to the board at each board meeting until funding is either secured or denied. All right, the motion's been presented and seconded. All in favor, please raise your hand. Those opposed? All right. The motion doesn't carry. Okay. All right. Are there any other questions while we have our panel for the FY 2018 budget? All right. Um, will the panel still be available during the heat closure discussion? Um, I think they will be here in the room. Yes. I'll go anywhere. Yeah. Thank All right. You. Thank you, gentlemen. All right, our uh, next item on the agenda is new business, a review of the Board Ed of Education Policy 6303. Um, at the board's meeting on August 9th, 2016, the board unanimously adopted Policy 6303, emergency closures, delayed opening, and early dismissal of schools and offices. Since the implementation of the policy, board members, the board office, and the office of, superintendent, of the superintendent have received numerous phone calls and emails. Based on the response from our stakeholders and as a result of the media attention, I ask that this topic be placed on tonight's agenda for discussion. At this time, I ask Ms. Michelle Prumo, Chief of Staff, to provide an overview of the number and nature of phone calls and emails that have been received by both the board office and the office of superintendent since the implementation of the policy. Thank you, Ms. Prumo. Thank you, Mr. McDaniels, and good evening, everyone. The following information that I'm going to share with you are phone calls and emails that were received um, in the board's office, as well as the superintendent's office since school started for students and the implementation of the board's policy 6303. The dates I'm going to cover are August 25th, 26th, 29th, and today the 30th. On Thursday, August 25th, 37 emails and calls were received, 10 of which included the board. The others came directly to the superintendent's office. 34 questioned why schools were open that day. On Friday, August 26th, if you recall, schools, non-air conditioned schools were closed. Uh, 27 emails were received. One included the board. The rest were received by the superintendent's office. Monday, August 29th, non-air conditioned schools were closed. 30 emails were received, three included the board, the rest went to the office of the superintendent. To summarize the context of the emails we received on Friday and Monday, when schools, air, non-air conditioned schools were closed, those emails and calls focused on the lack of instruction for students in the schools which were closed. 
not all of them, but some of them did reference after school activities, especially athletics being canceled. And also that some students in our Title I schools did not receive breakfast and lunch. Some offered solutions such as generator, generators and portable ACs. And what I do want to share, if any board member received emails to their private account and did not forward them to us, they were not included in this summary. For today, um, August 30th, 52 emails were received. 14 were received by the board, the remaining sent to the superintendent's office. 27 supported the policy as is in that um, in, in some of the emails of the 27, they asked for early dismissal. Seven did not support the policy and three discussed portable ACs. The other emails that I haven't mentioned were sort of outliers, nothing that um, was shared by the majority of people. For instance, one said we should close all schools, one said start after Labor Day. Thank you, uh, Ms. Prumo. Are, are there any questions from board members by, to Ms. Prumo about the correspondence? Um, I know a lot of board members did receive uh, communications over the last four days, and uh, they were varied in nature, but um, uh, both in support of our current policy and the, some of the concerns that Ms. Uh, Prumo also mentioned. All right, um, again, uh, Ms. Uh, Causey. So, uh, Mr. McDaniels, did you or Ms. Decker evaluate all of the emails that came to the board members directly? Um, I did not. I did not compile the um, emails that came directly. If I received an email that was just directed to me only, I did forward it to Ms. Decker. Um, we received a number of emails that were addressed to all board members, and since I believe that all board members were receiving those communications, I didn't forward those to the central office. So it's fair to say that there's a huge number of emails that have not been tabulated in terms of their content. I don't know. Well, I'm, I'm just saying my email my in-bin has been going strong um, since school started, um, and I did not tabulate. I was under the understanding that Ms. Decker might be doing that, but so if, if no board member forwarded it to her, then it's not, then it's not tabulated. Is that correct? That's um, correct. Yes. So your information included only what was forwarded to Ms. Decker. And what came directly to the Board of Ed? office, whether it was a phone call or to the board's email account. Okay. Thank you. Um, thank you. Because, uh, Mr. Chair, could I make a recommendation that, uh, <clears throat> that in the future, every email that we receive as individuals be forwarded to Ms. Decker? There is, there should be a right. process yes. for that because there is a way that people send us individual emails. We don't know if each other are getting them and we don't want Ms. Decker to get 10 emails of all the same thing, but nor do we want very important input from our constituents to not be recognized and tabulated. Right. I think, again, our practice, if, if you receive an individual uh, email that it is Forwarded, and I guess all of them that don't include Ms. Decker on there should be forwarded. Uh, to, I'll, I'll do that if we get a an email to all board members that doesn't show Ms. Decker on there. I'll make sure that she gets that. Because my recommendation from all of the ones that I have been reading is that they are in support of a heat closure policy. Some have also been very concerned about. Uh, after school activities. Um, I do recall one or two that were talking about the nutritional needs of students. Um, certainly they were concerned about instruction and a great many of them wanted to see solutions sooner than the date their school is scheduled. Many of them also asking for window air conditioners to be considered for their schools, for their children. I also got emails and the other board members can share what their what they received about students coming home and being um, feeling sick because of the heat. Thank you. Ms. Johnson. 
Um, in light of some of the emails that I received, I, I don't know if it's appropriate now to make a motion to amend the policy. Is that appropriate? Okay, I wanted to say a little something first. Um, we are in the business of educating our students. Thousands of students will be missing out on, a much needed, on their much needed instruction. Many parents need to be working for a living, and children could possibly be left at home. Schools provi school provided meals um, to our vulnerable populations will be missed as well. In particular, I've talked to a handful of foster students who happen to be in my district. Yes, they love being out of school and hanging out for the day. And these were elementary, middle, and high school students that I talked to. But when I pried a little bit more, they actually liked the consistency, the education, the comfort and stability of the school. Student athletes from around the county were wanting to stay in school so they could practice or play their sport. And to quote a Lansdowne High School athlete, yes, it's hot in here, but I'd rather be hot in school knowing get to, I get to play football at the end of the day than be hot in my hot house sitting next to my sister making another Musical.ly video. <laughs> mainly, I've heard, um, what I've mainly heard is that parents are worried about the likelihood of extended time out of school if this policy stays as is. Um, as is, it's very likely we'll miss multiple days the next couple of weeks and then again at the end of the school year. Many parents, students, administrators, teachers, and stakeholders that I have personally spoken with and through email but actually spoken with have two specific concerns about the policy as it stands right now. One being the academic loss with no need to make up those missed days. And the other being the fiscal concern. The other being, thank you, the other being the fiscal concerns paying for daycare, possible um, before and after care, and taking off from work. To the advocates who don't really want us to touch the policy, I, I hear you, um, I understand you, I have indeed experienced these hot, these cl hot classrooms myself. I actually do visit schools. Um, in fact, I would like to look at including a liberal leave policy or early dismissal for home and hospital programs for those kids with specific health conditions down the road. I also want to share some um, progress that the administration has made. In the 2012-13 school year, 59% of our schools had AC. At the end of the 17-18 school year, 91% of our schools will have air conditioning. In the 10 years prior to this administration, we made a 9% change in 10 years. So we've made a 32% change in just over five years. In the previous 10 years, they had made a 9% change. So we, we are, as a board, as an administration, everybody's working towards having 100% of the schools air conditioned. Um, my vote against Ms. Miller's motion was not a vote to vote down um, other options in the central air realm. It was a mandate for our superintendent to hold back a budget if he doesn't do something that, that two particular board members wanted him to do. So we're not at 100% quite yet. I don't, I, would, I don't speak for the board, but I would assume that every single board member wants central AC in all of our schools, and we won't be happy until we have 100%. So with that said, I ask the board to consider my amendment to the policy that states, if the heat index for the following school day is projected to hit 90 degrees by 11 a.m. that following day, the schools without AC will be closed for the day. That's it. Um, this still allows time for plant parents to plan off to have for the next to have off for the next day for their students. It does not drastically change the heat index from 90. Um, it does not call for additional resources. It does not interrupt the air-conditioned schools that are already going to remain open. And additionally, the PRC will review this policy again at the end of next school year. Thank you. Uh, there's a motion. Is there a second to the motion? Okay, it's a motion and a second. I'm sorry. Is that actually a motion? Sure, I can repeat Yes, please. It. I ask the board to consider my amendment to the policy. I make a motion to ask the board to consider my amendment to the policy that states if the heat index for the following school day is projected to hit 90 degrees by 11 a.m., the schools without AC will be closed for the day. Second. All right, it's been moved. I have a second. point of order. I had asked for legal opinion on whether we can legally change a policy outside yeah. of the three reader process. I did process. answer your, your email. Okay, I didn't get okay. that in time. Can you? Okay. Tell yes, us? we we can do that. It's a matter of procedure rather than policy that we have three readers. We want to make sure that the public has an opportunity to understand that we're going to uh, make a policy or present a policy. And I think in this case, uh, we did uh, comply with that. Okay. Thank you. 
Yes, Ms. Williams. Discussion? Yes. I'd like to make a statement. First of all, I want to thank the board members for unanimously approving the HEAP policy 6303. I think you were wise in doing so. I also want to thank the public and the media for their attention on this very important issue. I would like us to have no need for a HEAP policy, but unfortunately, there is still a need. And temporary portable air conditioner units are not viable at this time. Yet, some days, classrooms are still just too hot in unair conditioned schools for our children to properly learn or our teachers to properly teach. One speaker spoke tonight that nothing has changed, so why is the board considering changing the heat policy? Several other te teachers and parents have written echoing that same sentiment. However, still others argue that despite hot temperatures, they want their children to be able to still participate in athletics and or to otherwise not miss school. Some want to ensure that their children will be able to have breakfast and lunch. Others have concerns about childcare issues. But the policy was implemented to protect the safety, health, and well-being of our children during excessive heat temperatures in non-air-conditioned schools. And we have experienced excessive heat, and schools without air conditioning have been closed, as you have heard. If the implementing policy I'm sorry, if the implemented policy is not amended tonight, the superintendent will be required, undoubtedly, to close all non-air conditioned schools once again when the heat index reaches 90 degrees at any time the following day. So the real question is, are we now no longer concerned about the safety health and well-being of our kids and non-air conditioned schools to the point where we change the policy to allow schools to remain open during excessive heat temperatures? My answer is no way. And in my judgment, <laughs> in my judgment to amend the policy to only allow closure if, if the heat index reaches 90 degrees by 11 a.m is in essence eliminating a heat closure policy because it is very unlikely that it will reach 90 degrees, a 90 degree index by 11 a.m. I personally would be supportive of this 11 a.m. time amendment if a parent or guardian who decides to keep his or her child home when the heat index is forecast to reach 90 degrees at any time before 3 p.m., then that, and that child's absence would be an excused absence with a note from the child's parent, and, and no new curriculum or academic material would be introduced when that heat index had reached 90 degrees at any time before 3 p.m. Because this would ensure those parents who for good reason believed that they needed to protect the health, safety, and well-being of their children could keep their children home without that child being penalized or fear that they would fall behind in non-air conditioned schools. This would also empower the parents and affected non-air conditioned schools while also allowing the school to, schools to still hold uh, athletic activities in the evening. And it would also allow parents who want their kids in school despite the heat index temperature to be in school. Absent this, the board is right back to where it started, leaving the discretion to close schools in the hands solely of the superintendent. So why, I ask, why was time wasted to ever create a heat closure policy? All right. Uh, Ms. Miller. Thank you. I'd like to echo what Ms. Williams just said. Um, BCPS is number one priority even before 
education of our children is the health and safety of our students and staff. Uh, we set that policy just three weeks ago um, to address an urgent need with regards to health and safety. Um, conditions are still unhealthy. Again, nothing has changed. I'm not understanding what the impetus was for requesting a change other than um, there have been some parents uh, who have uh, expressed concerns about some logistical issues. Um, and of course there are logistical issues. Um, all of the emails that I received from teachers, BCPS teachers, have asked us to keep the policy as it stands. Um, I believe that this request to amend the policy is for the sole purpose of reducing the number of days uh, that school will be closed due to heat. So in other words, we are exchanging our duty to protect the health and safety of our students in order to address logistical issues and alleviate some of those concerns, which uh, uh, misses the boat entirely, and we're not doing our job if we allow that. Um, the concerns about loss of instructional time when schools are closed, uh, I wanted to answer to that. Uh, instru instructional time is already compromised in these extreme heat conditions. So when schools are closed for heat, what we're losing is not instructional time. We're losing coping with unhealthy extreme heat time. Um, <clears throat> I also wanted to bring up the point that we haven't collected the data on classroom, inside classroom temperatures yet to really know what's going on inside the classrooms. Uh, so we can only go by anecdotal. And the anecdotal information that we're receiving from um, parent advocates and teachers is that the inside temperatures are roughly in the neighborhood of 10 degrees hotter than the outside heat index. So if we set a time right now, and I, I just want to make sure that we're all on the same, um, on the same page regarding what's being proposed here. Mm -hmm. um, right now, as the policy stands, any time during the day that it reaches 90, uh, that's considered a too hot day to be healthy. So uh, the hottest time of the day is, is about between 3 and 4 o'clock. If we set a time limit and bring it down to 11 a.m., that means that day reached 90 degrees at 11 a.m. So it's going to reach much more than that. It's, it could reach 95 or more degrees by 3 or 4 p.m. Um, so we are actually weakening here. The, lo the earlier the time that we set, the more we're weakening the protection of our students and staff. Um, just bear with me. Um, I really think that we need to collect information on inside classroom temperatures, whether we pass this amendment or not. Uh, that will allow us to really analyze what's going on and be able to make more informed decisions because that's the important factor is how hot is it inside these greenhouse classrooms. Um, and keep in mind that the elementary schools are open till 4 p.m. So if we set an 11 a.m., those kids are going to be sitting in those classrooms 
that could be 89 degrees at 11 a.m. for five more hours. It might be 99 inside the classroom and, and higher as the temperature goes up throughout the day. Um, so I mean, I, I just have a couple of questions here without relinquishing the floor. Um, I would like to ask what was the impetus behind seeking an amendment to a policy that we just passed three weeks ago? Was that directed to me, I'm assuming? So I, I would think. The reason that we wrote the policy to begin with, one of the reasons was a lot of information that we received from a particular um, ABC schools. And they provided us with a lot of information um, statistical information, anecdotal information, and research that they had done. And that was the majority of, the, I'm not speaking for anybody else, of the, of the research that I received and that I looked at. Afterwards, there are many layers to every story. And the, the other side of the story, the other layer, is what I hadn't done my due diligence on and researched. And yes, I was reached out to by probably the same amount of emails as you had, and I, reached, I was reached out to by teachers who want to stay in school, who want to be able to continue to teach, and asked, and I was, I polled probably about 45 teachers, and um, this number, this this time, is what was was brought uh, between, in the poll. So the impetus is listening to my constituents, knowing that we did a good, good work on the policy as it stands, but knowing now that afterwards it needs to be tweaked a little bit. Um, Ms. Wait, Bratt, uh, uh, are you, are you, oh, yes, I, I'm uh, not finished, I'm sorry. Okay. Um, and there were a number of constituents that expressed the desire for this heat closure policy over, you know, our time on the board over the last almost year and a half. Um, and we certainly shouldn't be putting aside their requests over uh, requests that have just come in in the past couple of weeks. Now, I, I know that we are now dealing with the actual ramifications, so I'm, I'm not against looking at that and seeing, you know, if we can solve some, alleviate some of that. Can I just address that statement? Yeah. You know, this is speaking me as a, a, a prior board member. Until I was on the board, I didn't know about every policy that came through. I didn't know about all of the different rules. I didn't know about all the things that happened in the school system, not even in my individual children's school. So to begrudge a parent who now has to, yeah, they're going to feel the ramifications of, of this policy um, and, the heat, and the, the heat issue, many people aren't as empowered as certain other groups out there. And so those are the groups that I heard from. So please don't begrudge those people that reached out to me after the fact, because they might not have been as informed along the way. I, I agree, and I, I tried to express that. Um, Dr. Dance, uh, regarding the waiver. He stepped out. Oh, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't even look over there. Okay. Uh, well, let me just pose the question then to the, the board. Um, regarding the waiver request for, um, you know, the missed days, uh, I'm wondering if we all have a plan B. Plan B, if that waiver is denied, uh, that's something we're going to need to consider. Um, and, and I would like to make a motion on this. Should I make it at this point, or no, continue? We have a, a motion on the floor. Well, it's a motion to amend, actually. Um, All right. You have a motion. Okay, go ahead. Yes. I move to amend the the. I move to amend the motion to also include the following schools. Schools with non-functioning AC, so there's schools that have AC, but it's not working, and schools with partial AC that still have general classrooms without air conditioning. You're going to amend Ms. So Johnson's motion? That's a motion, motion to amend. So you want to change the time to 11 and uh, include additional schools? 
Um, well, I don't want to change the time to a, to 11, but, but if we're motion. going to if we're going to well, vote on that, my motion is to change the time to 11. So let's can we vote on my motion what? then? Well, and that's a separate I, motion. I have they make it separate. I'll second it. You know, I'll second it. Make okay. It all right, I'll, I'll make a, I'll withdraw that motion then, and we'll do that separately. Then I have a, another motion that I do want to include here. Um, uh, you're gonna, again, your intent is to amend the motion on the floor. Yes, I, okay. I move to amend the motion to require that inside temperatures in all non-air conditioned general classrooms um, are collected uh, and analyzed uh, over the next 10 school days. So then we still, my so motion to amend yeah. still so stands. It would be separate, okay. it would be voted on separately. No, it would just, no. It would That's be, an addition motion to, to amend would be voted on separately before, and then right. it would be a joint motion with right. yes. Ms. Johnson. Yes, motion. that's what I intend. All right. So is there a second to Ms. Johnson's motion? I mean, Ms. Uh, Miller's motion? Monitoring the yes. classroom temperatures? I'll second monitoring the classroom temperatures in the non air conditioned schools. Right. Is there a discussion about that? I'm sorry. Um, is this a motion that we can that can be done separate? Because um, I know personally I don't support 11, uh, the cutoff at 11. But I would be interested in having this data collected, if at all possible. Well, say that again. I'm sorry, I missed that. Oh, sorry. I agree. I'm. I agree with her. I. I don't believe 11 is appropriate, but if 11 gets passed, I want to make sure that we're measuring the temperatures in the room. So yes, that's okay. what I'm intending. That can be a separate I think I would be, but okay. I would be more willing. To. So, again, you've seconded Miss Miller's motion. Is there any more discussion on that? Um, well, I would like to have an amendment also. Well, Let's. You have to vote on this one. You we have, have, to, have to. Well, it's a part. It's an amendment to that. Well, I have. Well, a, I think we vote on one amendment at a time. Yeah. Okay. So okay, per perhaps it would be Long better to vote on the whole motion. That's yes. all. Yes. Uh, go ahead, Ms. Causey. I was just going to say I have. There are a number of comments, and other people have not. Other board members have not made their comments. So I would. I do not want the vote to take place on Ms. Johnson's motion. primary motion until all discussion is done. All right. Well, right now we're just voting on the amendment. Thank uh, you. There's, no further discussion on the amendment. All in favor, please raise your hand. All those opposed. So the amendment does not carry. And what was the count? The three. And Mr. Stewart. And Mr. Stewart. And, and Ms. Williams. All right, let's, uh, all in favor again, please raise to the I, I didn't vote because I am so confused. <laughs> <laughs> voting on. <laughs> We're voting on Ms. Miller's amendment to. Uh, I know, but they're going back and forth. I'm getting yes. dizzy. <laughs> All right. Maybe it's too hot in here. <laughs> <laughs> it is hot in here, actually. Oh, maybe it's so the, the amendment did not carry. So now we're back to the original motion that Ms. Johnson made. Is there a further discussion on Ms. Johnson's uh, motion? Yes, there's further discussion on Ms. Johnson's. Okay, go ahead. Thank you very much. In all of the emails that we have received and uh, phone calls that I have received and in all of the media coverage that has occurred and comments to um, articles in the newspaper and also <laughs> comments on radio shows, what I have heard is a number of folks that are very concerned about their students, they're very concerned about their athletes, the teachers are very concerned about their students, and also there is some misunderstandings about the policy. So the first thing I wanted to do was to just quickly clear up about the policy 6303. Well, um, we do have a, a motion. That's, is this specifically addressing the motion that's on the floor? Yes, it all specifically addresses the motion. It's about the policy. It's making sure that the constituents understand that their questions and concerns about it are addressed up to this point so that when we make a vote, they'll understand the full ramifications of what we're doing. And also, I have questions of our um, staff to see that would inform what this vote 
whether this vote should be approved or not. All right. We, okay, go ahead. But we, we do need to, to, in order to allow the superintendent to give proper notice, if we don't change it, we'd like to have our vote prior to 8 o'clock, if we could. Okay, well, well that might have been helpful to know before yeah. 5 of 8 o'clock. Can I make an amendment then to the motion? Uh, Ms. Causey has the floor. Uh, did you have... Uh, did you have a discussion on the point? Well, I think that the time should be later, the way that Romaine suggested that it should, that the heat index by 3 o'clock should be added if we have to make a vote right now for something to be implemented tomorrow. But there are other possibilities of what can happen in the school system to help these students, to help the athletes, and that's why I wanted to have a complete discussion, but quickly, but it's not gonna be five of five if we're gonna take a vote. So I would make my comment quickly that I don't support changing the heat policy to 11 a.m., but rather to change it to Mr. William, Mrs. Williams' Actually, suggestion. It is 11. I, I, I was, can I just clarify then what I was recommending? I, I hear what you're saying, Kathleen, but what I'm saying is they can, if we're going to vote to change the policy, and 11 a.m. is fine for closure, but my recommendation is that there be an excused absence built in um, for parents who want to keep their kids home if the forecast is uh, 90 degrees at any time before 3, because I don't want parents who want to keep their children home for safety and health reasons to feel like, oh my gosh, my child is going to be penalized and punished. Everybody else is going to school because they didn't close schools, but it's so hot and my child has health issues. So I'm supportive of 11 a.m. if there's that built-in excused absence for parents who need to make that decision for health and safety reasons. But the issue of 11 a.m. still leaves our little people, our elementary school children, in school for five hours after it has reached 90-degree heat index. Five well, hours. Well, can I say that, let me further amend the superintendent will also con retain discretion to make whatever decision he needs to make at that time. I think we should come to a time that we agree on and then right, talk um, about other issues. The, I'm going to Okay, I'm gonna I have ask, a motion. Uh, Does a second? Ms. Williams, Ms. Williams, just wanted to... Could you state your motion yeah. again? My amendment to the motion for 11 a.m. is that there be a built-in excused absence allowed to parents who choose to keep their children home if the heat index reaches 90 degrees by 3 p.m. and if the superintendent has not made the decision to close schools by 11 a.m., that he retains the, the discretion to take whatever action he, need, he deems appropriate. All right. So I, would, I would ask general counsel if she can weigh in on excuse versus unexcused absences for the state of Maryland. Uh, lawful and unlawful absences are governed by the Code of Maryland regulations. So the State Board of Education in Comar 13A 0801-03 defines what a lawful absence is. And principals and pupil personnel workers may request uh, medical notes from parents if a student is claims to be absent on the basis of illness and if it's extended. So you do not have the sole authority to determine what a lawful absence is. No, but we're saying it would be with a note from their parents saying it was for a medical reason. And what I'm saying is that the state regulation that governs all local boards of education indicates that it must be accompanied by a doctor's note. Um, right. I have a, just that's crazy. just a, one moment. All right. Now again, and I don't support it. We we have a motion. Yeah, we have a motion that's been seconded. We are discussing Miss Williams' motion. We've gotten advice from counsel, and now we're going to continue the discussion. I'm going to go to Miss Miller so that everybody has a chance to weigh in. Well, I object to being rushed into a decision that's going to impact our children for potentially years to come so that we don't have to deal with closure tomorrow. Let's have a full discussion and do this right and not the way we normally do things by the seat of our pants being rushed. Um, 
again, what we're doing here by putting in the 11 a.m. is we are weakening the policy that we passed three weeks ago. Um, let's let's understand that that's understand what we're that. doing here. We, yes, we understand. Just a minute, Miss Miss Miller has Miss Miller has the floor we're one at a time. Yeah, thank you. Um, Uh, I, I, I'm going to stop right here because I'll, I will have another motion after we vote on this. Uh, Mr. Birch. Uh, thank you ever so much, Mr. Chairman. Um, I've been gathering information from a variety of sources, including the... Yeah, uh, I just, I'm sorry. That does not say that. 03 says for just, activists, including this, out of order, yes. then okay. Including the systems uh, council. A um, couple of thoughts. One, lawful absence is, there's a definition for it. One can tweak or say whatever, but let's take it at as presented, a lawful absence. This board's not gonna be able to define a lawful absence. It's already been done for us. We can agree, disagree, but it's defined. Second piece, how then does one comply with the definition of lawful absence? Well, you know, there's something called the Family Medical Leave Act. And in the Family Medical Leave Act, and I'm not saying this is that, but what I'm sharing with you is doctors, based on their knowledge, training, experience, in the medical profession, can say, to a reasonable degree of medical certainty, that this patient will require, on average, approximately however much uh, uh, attention during a period of time. Believe it or not, doctors have a pine and given these kind of notes. What I think is at issue here is whether one can have a doctor, a pediatrician, who has been uh, treating, you know, a uh, child, and I'll just use a lay person's term because I'm not a doctor, but who may have. Uh, heightened, for whatever term, however that applies, heightened heat sensitivities, that in fact this child is going to be uh, more at risk, however that's defined, uh, in, a hot in, in a warm environment where the temperature varies. So that note is then provided to a principal. The principal now has lawfully complied. It's kept on file. When we have these days, which everyone acknowledges are not every day of the year, most likely in the beginning of the school year, most likely at the end of the school year, as we progress to air conditioning, then the definition of lawful absence is satisfied. The requirement of a doctor's note is satisfied in advance. It is there. The parent is acknowledging uh, the reason why the child was absent because a doctor, the knowledge, training, experience, to a reasonable degree of medical certainty, has already opined about the, this particular child's sensitivity. State law is complied with, and um, we're then able to have a heat policy that may say 11 o'clock and then may say excused absence. And it isn't being unilater uh, unilaterally determined by the board because that's not within our purview to establish that authority. That's already been defined for us legally by state law. And that's what the advice of counsel was, uh, while it's the counsel for the system, that's what her advice was. So if we take that as being a reasonable interpretation, whether you agree or disagree, well then one can now comply. 11 a.m. and uh, excused absence is based on a note provided to the principal in advance in anticipation that there may be days such as this. Uh, Mr. Collins. I just wanted to quickly say, I think I'm correct that all the children get a medical exam before the school year starts, don't they? Well, I think, I think the vast majority of them do, and certainly any parent who has a child with, a, with an issue um, of health concerning heat would do that if the child has asthma or some other problem. So, so in uh, remain an answer to your concern, I don't think it's a, I don't think it's a, a difficulty because I, I'm not, I just heard what Steve said relative to, he thinks it's covered anyway, but I think it's, for practically speaking, the, the parents are going to have the children go to the doctor so they could get that, that, that note very easily and have it on file. So I think that would solve your concern uh, as expressed before. And when we were addressing the, um, the religious holidays, we also adopted the policy that said it would not be held against the child for perfect attendance. So at a minimum, we, we ought to acknowledge that because some parents are also concerned about keeping their child home because then that means they won't have perfect attendance. And for some parents, that's important. That's right. 
I'm, I'm in favor of, of and of we did not it wasn't it, we didn't have to do anything to the statute nothing violated the law in doing that I think you're. I, I think we should proceed with your direction on that, and I think we Council, should. Council, am I correct? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, I, I think we should. I think we should uh, include include your provisions relative to to uh, um, the, the issue of excusing the, of excusing the excused absences. So I, I want to support your position on that. All right, uh, Ms. Brett, you had a comment. Um, Frankly, I think that a lot of the discussion we've been having is just logistics. I think the absent versus not absent, whether it's 11 o'clock, I don't think any of that really matters because I don't think that this policy should be amended. Because since this vote was taken to approve the policy, nothing's changed. The National Oceanic, Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration still finds that temperatures over 90 degrees are cause for extreme caution, whether that's at 11 in the morning or at 11.30. And I don't see none of the emails I've read, none of the testimony, none of the people I've spoken to will disagree that these are unsafe conditions for our students. And I think that's our number one priority. PRC submitted for us um, several statistics during our voting process, one of which said that there were the same number of hospitalizations for schools with air conditioning as without. And we have less than a quarter of our schools not air conditioned, which means there are we are four times more likely to have hospitalizations at schools that do not have air conditioning. I think that this is clearly a hazard to our student safety and I do not support as a student having this policy amended. Thank you. Again, we have the amended motion on the floor again from Mrs. Ms. Williams. Is there any discussion on the story that says so well, yeah. I had a question for Ms. Howie as well with the definition of lawful absence uh, per Comar and that particular reg. Under exception J, it says an exception can be other emergency or set of circumstances which in the judgment of the superintendent or designee constitutes a good and sufficient cause for absence from school. It seems like that might fit, provided that I think the definition of superintendent or designee means our local superintendent, which I believe in this provision it does. So yeah, I understand that maybe we would face a little bit of issue going forward, but I, perhaps we can address that moving forward. Again, we've only had school open for about five days and we've revisited this policy. And by the way, folks, this is how policy making goes. Sometimes you put things into play and you didn't think of unintended consequences like vulnerable populations being affected more significantly than others. So some, some things have changed, which is that we've gotten additional perspective from vulnerable populations. That's okay. But the reality is we need to continue to try to get this right while we focus on our capital budget on AC, which would run this whole problem moot anyway. Yes. All right. Uh, Mr. Collins. Now, I, oh, now are we voting on Romaine's? Uh, we're just discussing Romaine's yeah, amendment. Okay. Oh, I already expressed my support for that. Shall we vote? All right, Mr. Gillis. Yeah, I'd like to say that um, uh, we all support uh, healthy school environments, and the uh, board's goals are not only laudable but are correct. Um, but we also need to keep in mind that sometimes bright line policies um, are not everything that we thought when we when we first instituted. I'm sorry I wasn't here on that August 9 meeting to express these things. Um, but uh, sometimes uh, those bright line policies preclude the flexibility that rules have with the superintendent. And when we need to try to maximize educational time, the goals that must be balanced are the ones we've talked about, uh, predictable schedules for both students and families, uh, transportation needs, uh, athletics, um, parent work schedules, uh, meals, uh, daycare, and the policy now handcuffs our superintendent's ability to juggle all of those important and, um, and uh, uh, very important goals. Uh, so not only uh, does the amendment probably make this a little better, uh, but there's a lot of other things that can make it better to make certain that athletics could continue, uh, that children could stay at the school facility um, even if schools close early uh, so that there aren't transportation concerns, so there aren't parents who have to all make last minute daycare arrangements so that there aren't, um, uh, as I said, transportation issues. So I think that the policy is good. The policy has always been uh, to make certain that we have a safe environment, but there's a lot of things that we could accomplish if it was left to the superintendent's discretion instead of us trying to be um, both meteorologists um, and the like. Because we all know that a, a, 
a hot environment is not a good environment, but we also know that there's a lot of things that we need to juggle with 110,000 kids other than a bright line policy. All right. Um, Ms. Causey? One I would like to ask, has the decision already been made and so can we just make, have a thoughtful discussion? I don't, I don't believe so. What we, we haven't decided by about tomorrow, about? have we? No, we've, we've not decided on tomorrow. I just got the most recent update from our folks that we will have, according to your board policy, an area of the county where the heat index will be projected overnight tomorrow at one point during the day. So based on your current policy, schools will be closed to those 37 schools. Okay. However, I am not making any decision on those schools until the board has made a vote tonight. But according to your current policy, that would be the decision for tomorrow. I have not had my comments. I'm sorry? What time in that one area is it reached? 2 p.m. Okay. I'm sorry, we have it at 1. And supposed to be 91 to 35 p.m. All right, we have to just keep order during our discussion. Ms. Causey, I believe you have the floor at this point. Thank you. What I wanted to do was to clarify the policy 6303. Uh, I had spoken at the last meeting. Ms. Fazi, could I? We're, we're, we're trying to get through the motion that's on the table. If you could speak directly to that, the amendment, so that we could either go back to the original and then we could have further discussion there. But we need to try to resolve this amendment that's on the floor currently. I understand that. And there's a number of issues that have to do with what, whether this amendment remains amendment to Ms. Johnson's amendment should be, is that the best decision for the children? There are several factors that are involved in the policy 6303, which I've been trying to get to for 30 minutes, and I appreciate the comments of all of my fellow board members. The issues are, number one, as everyone has pointed out, the health and safety needs of the students. And I would like to say that the original policy proposed and approved by the Policy Review Committee included the time of 11 a.m., but it also included a time later than that because we were hoping to be able to have early dismissals so that there would not be as much time missed by the students. But what happened was is we were informed Policy Review Committee, I should say, was informed, I was not available to be at that meeting July 13th, that the Maryland State Superintendent would consider granting waivers to the school system. The committee voted to amend the policy should such a waiver be possible. The super, then Ms. Williams received before the August 9th meeting a statement from the superintendent's staff stating that the superintendent has advised Chair Lady Williams that the state superintendent will grant waivers for the closure of non-air conditioned schools. As a result, the committee is presenting policy 6303 to you with the following amendment, which changed the policy from closing all schools to only the non-air conditioned schools, and staff presented the comment 90 degree Fahrenheit at any time during the following day. So I do believe that there should be a time that is made available, but I do not, that is specified, but I do not believe that 11 a.m. is appropriate given that our littlest people, our most vulnerable population, the elementary students are in school up until four o'clock. Well, so I would, I would, I, I'm not, no, would you speak to the amendment specifically that's on the floor? So I don't believe that Ms. Williams' amendment is appropriate what? in just granting, um, excused absences to the children. And I don't believe we should muddy the waters with, I, because I don't believe the statement is clear about the superintendent having additional discretion. Is that between heat index at certain times? I just don't think that Ms. Williams' um, um, motion actually addresses her original comments about really being careful with the students. I would also like to understand before we adopt a policy, uh, an amendment to the policy that would again be closing only non-air conditioned schools if we don't understand from the state superintendent whether in fact he did get a response from the state, state superintendent that she will grant waivers. That's what this said that is what we voted on. All right, thank you. <coughs> Ms. Miller. No, there's a question there for Dr. Dance and I'm 
and, and then I, I have additional I comments. Question all night. I've had conversations with the state superintendent. The state superintendent every year approves individual school waivers, such as the Hereford Zone. We have to close those. I have to submit a letter to the state superintendent to waive the days in those schools. I've had conversations with her. As she's advised me, though, we want to make sure we're protecting as much instructional time as we can. But she has the authority to grant individual school waivers. The Board of Ed for the state has to grant district waivers. When we made that recommendation to PRC at that particular point, we would have to close schools for the entire system if we're going to close half day. There's no way I can get buses back around to close just those 37 schools half day and then be able to start high school dismissal right around 2 o'clock. So it's either we close the 37 schools for the day or you have to close the, end of the entire school system for half day. Well, one of the things that we, that the question that I wanted to ask um, Mr. Smith, I guess, or you, is instead of a two-hour dismissal, if it's a three-hour dis three early, does that allow enough time for the buses to dismiss the 37 schools three hours early before they have to get to the high schools. Because three hours early will still allow our um, students to get to school, and if they have breakfast or lunch that they require, then that would be good. They could have a compressed schedule, connect with every teacher, turn in homework, have some instruction, and then take home homework. So it would really help if we could have that transportation issue settled. and it's. No, and that's a very legitimate question. The only issue is you have 37 unerogated schools at elementary, middle, and high. All of our buses are tiered. So if all of our buses are tiered, and they have schools around the entire county. So the, if I'm going to dismiss those schools three hours early, there's still no way for them to make it around because they're going to be driving for different levels. If it was all high school, absolutely I could do it. But if it's elementary, middle, and high, there's no way I can do it. In addition, we have elementary schools who are on two tiers. So we have late start arrival elementary schools and early start. So we're not going to be able to do that. We're going to either have to close the entire system half day, which we can do two, three hours early, however the board would ask me to do it, or we would have to just close those 37 schools. What if all 37 schools get dismissed at the same time? If all 37 schools got dismissed at noon? So if, we still have some of those buses. Index. We still have some of those buses that do dual runs at those schools. So I could technically still have one bus that does a run for an elementary and a high school that does not have air conditioning. But if you have the rest of the buses available that aren't doing anything, then they could be pulled into service for these extreme conditions yeah. where our students are losing instructional time, they're losing the, their ability to have breakfast and lunch. I think you're asking me for a logistical nightmare that I would not do for the system. I don't know if anyone's noticed, but we have a logistical nightmare, and it's called 27,000 students in non-air conditioned classrooms, which at this point in the evening, I just have to say in the year 2016 is completely unacceptable. And it has been done in Anne Arundel County 12 years ago for just a few million dollars. And we're talking about a capital construction request in hundreds of millions of dollars to try and cram through central air conditioning. Mr. Causey, I would ask you to speak on the motion that's on the floor, because we, we are not able to move forward with uh, these tangential type of con comments. I would hardly call this tangential, but I understand you're wanting to keep the order and the flow of the meeting. That being said, I would ask Kevin Smith to consider it and see if there's something that can be done, because then we could come back and make a change based on how we can provide instructional time to our students. To, to that point, we, we have said that next year, with the low number of schools without central air, we can do that. We cannot do it for the 16, 17 year. Thank you. The um, other thing is I'd like to support Ms. Bratt's uh, indication of her concerns about changing the policy, given the heat index. I know many people have opinions, but this is the NAOO talking about the heat index, and it was considered by the Policy Review Committee, which talks about the, the extreme caution, including sunstroke, muscle cramps, and or heat exhaustion possible with prolonged exposure and or physical activity. And those are in Ms. the- Ms. Causey, we're, we're here's trying the point. to- what, Here's the yes, point. Ms. Williams- So prolonged exposure would include elementary school students five hours additionally in a class if a call is made at 11 a.m. So I would not support that, and I would ask my board members to not support that, but that we could perhaps come to a later time that would be more protective of our elementary school children. Thank you.
Ms. Milt, you have a comment on the amended motion? Yes. Uh, several board members have expressed that we didn't uh, properly consider all of the ramifications of the policy that we passed three weeks ago. Uh, so I, Ms. Miller, again, this is not, we're, we're trying to oh, discuss no, the amendment. I amend. am. So, uh, so what I suggest is let's not make the same mistake again and let's consider the ramifications of Ms. Williams' uh, motion to amend. Um, with what she is suggesting, certain populations will be more vulnerable and it will create more inequities within the system. There uh, are what? children, we've, we've mentioned the asthmatic children, um, children with other health issues. Our younger populations are gonna be more susceptible and they're the ones that are going to be in these classrooms for more hours until 4 p.m. Um, certain schools are hotter than other schools, so we're gonna find those parents pulling the kids out uh, more than in other schools. So these are all areas where this is creating inequities. Um, elementary versus high school. Uh, additionally, this does not address at all our teachers who are still gonna be in the classrooms if we don't close school. So we are absolutely ignoring our staff in this equation here. Thank you. I'm just very confused because my only amendment was that there'd be an excused absence. The original amendment is 11 a.m. So I'm totally confused with you addressing my, my amendment as somehow adversely affecting the kids. The original motion is for school to close at 11 a.m. My amendment is that there be a, an excused absence determined by that individual child's parent or guardian. And that can be made if the heat index reaches 90 by three. So they can make that decision for themselves without fear that their child is somehow gonna be missing out or have imperfect attendance or, or otherwise. So nothing changed in terms of the 11 a.m. Uh, time frame. Um, additionally, the reason it matters is that you're trying to make the 11 a.m. time be more palatable by then allowing parents to pull their kids out and have it be an excused absence. What I'm trying to, to account for is the fact that there are parents who would like the athletics program to go on. There are parents who would who are concerned about daycare issues. Um, you know, there are also parents who are concerned that their child may or may not, you know, be able to, to have a meal. So I would like to call for the vote. Okay, just a minute. Uh, Ms. Causey, Mr. Collins has a question. He has the floor. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman. Uh, oh, all right. Well, um, I, 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 would, I, would accede, I would accede to the call for the vote. All right, is there a second on the motion to call? All right. All right, all those in favor, please raise your hand to call for the vote. So this one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Is that two, th that's not two thirds. Well, I believe it's three of them. Okay, yeah, let's get some hands. Yeah. Call for the vote. Call for the vote. So that's, uh, that two thirds? Okay. All right. We have two thirds of the vote, so we'll call for the vote. Uh, Please clarify the vote. The motion? Please. Uh, Ms. Williams, will you state your motion, your amendment did motion again? I'd ask Marisol to make the motion with the amendment. No, no, no. Just on the yeah, amendment. amendment. Just on. The amendment is simply that we accept the 11 a.m. closure time and that we um, add in an excused absence um, at the discretion of the parent or guardian if the heat index reaches 90 degrees All right. by 3 p.m. Well, All right. With, that's, that's inconsistent. With, that's inconsistent. Uh, Ms. Johnson's motion is if the heat index is 90 or above by 11 a.m., 
that the superintendent will close schools. So you don't want to have a 3 p.m. No, that's not inconsistent. It's not at all. Two separate things. Two separate things. Okay. All right. Correct. All right. You're right. All right. All, all in favor of the amended motion, please. Can, please, can she please state that again? If Mr. Gillis is not clear on what the vote is, it should be very clear to okay. every board member. What all right. That's why I asked Marisol to make her motion. But this is what I'm saying, that Marisol's motion was that schools, my understanding, that the superintendent be empowered to, to close schools if the heat index is projected to reach 90 degrees the following day by 11 a.m. I said in support of that, that in addition to that, that if it reached 3 p.m. that following day, that parents individually for themselves could also decide to keep their child home and it would be an excused absence. Understood. All right, thank you. Okay, all those in favor of the amended motion, oh, no, please, just the amendment. amendment, please raise your hand. And I'm a no. And you're a no? So the motion carries. The, ame the amendment. amendment carries. All right, now we're back to the main motion. Main motion. Amended motion. Amended motion. Amended, amended motion. motion. Amended, right. amended. amended motion. Right. All right. So. And yes, please. The board directs the superintendent to close all schools when the heat index is forecast to reach at least 90 degrees Fahrenheit by 11 a.m. the following day. All right. Um, and it's been and second. Okay, and we're, we're, it's also it's, with the amendment now. And with the amendment. The amendment. And Ms. Causey. I'd like to make a comment. Um, number one, we have not addressed the issue of athletics, and I do want to review that because I believe that it's related to what we already passed and also what we have heard, and that needs to be a discussion that includes questions to staff. And second, I would just suggest to my fellow board members that if we do vote no on this amendment, which I am going to do, that we could agree to set a later time that would be more protective of our elementary school children who under this amendment could sit in classrooms for five hours with the heat index at 90 and climbing. So can we agree that we'll be having additional discussion about the athletics? I think we can always have a, additional That discussion. would be a motion to amend. We'll, we'll do this call to the, we've. Mr. Chairman. Yes, Mr. Um, Collins. Yeah. I think, I think that the amendment that we just passed was really covers, covers all of these concerns, you know. The, there's a very small number of parents who are concerned about this, it, it appears to me, for several reasons. Um, Chief of Staff Prumo told us about all of the folks who communicated with the board about this. I know, th I know the, f the small number of people that have communicated with me personally just in, a, in casual conversation throughout the community. And, and I also know that for the whole history of Baltimore County, we have never dealt with this issue. And I'm not gonna tell you the story again about my 30 years in the hottest spot in Baltimore County Schools, this top floor of Kenwood High School, but without any heat policy or ever getting out a day for early because it was hot. I'm not gonna talk to you about that. But seriously, I mean, I think, I think that Nick hit it right on the head when he said, uh, it's appropriate to re-examine something. We thought we got it right, and we're in the midst of all of it right now. So, um, you know, keeping in mind that this is a major issue to a very small number of our constituents to begin with, because if they're concerned about the children, they will keep them home, and they will have an excused absence. I mean, we're covering that issue. Um, if they want them to be in school, as the gentleman who spoke to us first about athletics at, at his uh, son's high school, Franklin, and they do have a great program because they always go to the state tournament. I follow the sports closely. Um, he's covered. I think, I think this, is, this makes the policy much better, and I think uh, we, should, we should pass this, keeping in mind you know, that we all are trying to do the best for the students, but 
sometimes we're, we're, we're solving problems for a whole constituent of folks that don't want us to be solving their problems because they don't perceive that they have one. And I think we're getting close to that. I think this makes our policy much better. And I have been a huge fan of Mrs. Williams and the whole PRC committee. They work very hard. They study issues very thoroughly. And when they bring something to the board, they're very thorough. And at that time, it's their best judgment and their best interest. And that is the reason why I voted for it at the specific request of Mrs. Williams at, prior to the vote uh, a few weeks ago. And I'm going to vote for, and that's why I, I seconded her amendment, well, I second everybody's amendments. And I supported it and spoke for it. But I think, I think Mrs. Johnson and Mrs. Williams and the board, after this huge discussion, have come up with a very improved policy. And there's not a single thing wrong with improving a policy a few weeks after you adopted it when you see it in practice for a while. So I think we should adopt this. Uh, this and, and move on. Um, and again, if there's further matter for discussion, Lord knows I'm never the one to cut off discussion because I'm never the one that wants to shut up. And Ms. Causey. I make a motion to amend Ms. Johnson's amendment to extend the time to reach the 90 degree heat index until 3 p.m. Second. All right, it's been moved and second. Is there any discussion about that? Uh, Oh, and okay. I, I think we understand the logic behind these Effectively, motions. what we are doing with setting a time that early at 11 we, is we're raising we the temperature threshold. We understand that. Thank you. Um, I would just also like to say I completely disagree with my dearly respected board member, Senator Collins, about the number of constituents and stakeholders who care about this issue. My email has been jammed full, and I'm sorry I didn't forward them all to Ms. Decker. I have gotten phone calls, Facebook, the whole policy review committee process where we have worked on this this entire year. So this is a huge issue to, to huge amounts of, of parents and teachers, and we just have to get this right. We have to get this right, especially for the elementary school children, and we can revisit the athletics after we take this vote. We're talking about 25% of our student population being affected right now, not to mention all the teachers and staff, thousands and thousands of staff members. All right. All right, we've had the uh, amended motion. All no, this is uh, amendment. amendment to the motion. All those in, in favor, please raise your hand at changing the time to 3 p.m. trigger. All right, those opposed, please raise your hand. Okay, that amendment does not carry. Amen. All right. Okay, and now we're gonna vote on the uh, amended motion. Um, all in favor, please. I have one comment before we vote regarding the um, athletics. The policy states currently that the superintendent shall have the authority to cancel all school-sponsored activities based on weather conditions. <laughs> So the policy doesn't say that athletics have to be canceled. It's right. still up to the discretion of the superintendent. So let's be clear on that. That is really a non-issue left up to the superintendent. That's not true. Okay. All, right. All right. All in favor of the amended motion, please raise your hand. All right, those opposed, please raise your hand. The motion carries. All right, and Ms. Cause, you had additional discussion? Yes, we've received numerous comments from parents, students, and uh, also teachers and coaches and administrators about the impact of the heat closures on our high school student athletes. As I mentioned, Delaney alone has 1,300. I saw a very compelling video done by the Baltimore Sun uh, that featured uh, Josh Turner and Aaron Webb, who ran a captain's practice for the Franklin High School football team on Monday. And there were no classes for schools without air conditioning, so no official practice could be held. 
yet they had a fantastic attitude, a challenge that they have to overcome, and that they need to come out together as a team. So I want to clarify from staff, I have questions first before I would make a motion about how we can uh, um, accommodate these students who actually train in the heat and what we have heard is that the buildings are actually hotter so the fields outside are actually cooler. So if I could have uh, Mr. Smith or Dr. Dance or whoever would start the discussion of what policies are in place or or rules are in place that where we could accommodate these student athletes because as as uh, Ms. Miller pointed out and the policy review committee put in specifically is that the after school activities would be at the discretion of the superintendent absolutely so uh, based on the most recent vote by the board schools would be open uh, tomorrow for those 37 schools um, Per our union agreement with the Teachers Association of Baltimore County, um, when schools are closed, uh, teachers do not have to report. So therefore, and keep in mind, it's not just athletics, it's all after school activities. So we have many students who are in academic clubs as well. So you can't do one without the other. In addition, we, uh, student, many students rely on transportation in order to get to uh, school, in which case they stay back after school for the athletics or the academic competitions. Because there is no required supervision um, due to our teacher's agreement that we have with TAPCO, teachers are not required to be there and it becomes a liability issue if you have students in the building and not adequate coverage. So what would be necessary in order to make something happen? If we, would, we would have to go through collective bargaining with our, our, our bargaining units in order to change the language that the board approves in the bargaining agreements. If school is closed in one school for a power outage, for instance, does that automatically preclude that those students from that school participating in a athletic event? Yes that night yes and what about the if it happens on a Friday what happens on a Saturday we do have some discretion on weekends but traditionally when we close for inclement weather on Friday that then takes care of all your weekend activities now the, the caveat is if we were to close schools early then yes there's flexibility in order to allow for after school and evening activities to continue but when it's closed for the day it does become a liability issue so that would have been helpful to know before people voted on the policy that if we had early dismissal but you'd be closing the entire system. You can't close just those 37 schools. Because we don't have transportation capabilities. Yes. Even if we even And that's if again you just for the 16, 17 school them. year. Excuse me? That's just for the 16, 17 school year. 17, 18, we can actually have transportation routes just for those non and air conditioned schools. But I think what you would be asking me would be to create a logistical nightmare uh, for the system, which I would not recommend doing. Well, what would you recommend for the seniors that are on sports teams this year that are in schools that are not air conditioned? Per the board's policy, if it does not reach 90 degrees by 11 a.m., they'll be having practice or playing their games. I mean, I understand the passion that everyone has around this issue, but guys, we're making progress here. And I think to not acknowledge the progress that has been made, I think that's absurd. I do think it is. I think to continue going down the road of asking for portable units, it's not going to happen. We have an aggressive schedule, and my heart goes out to Pete Dixit, who every single day has contact with me on the number of projects that his team's doing to get central air into schools, to get schools replaced. So I think the board's made a decision. I think let's give staff an opportunity to, to, to implement your newly revised policy and to report back to you on how that policy is being implemented. Thank you. I would just right. like to say that, it, that going back to the point of um, even uh, tonight, fellow board members saying that portable units are not going to happen, that this is really an issue of the, this Board of Education not making decisions that are in the best interest of the, of the students, but rather conforming to others' lines in the sand. Uh, and and to, to say that we are making progress 
is true. We've made progress in raising awareness of how dysfunctional the system is because this can has been kicked down the road for years. The last four years, there have been $6 billion spent in Baltimore County public schools, and yet we remain behind, 12 years behind, Anne Arundel County Public Schools who got this done. The reason it's not being done is it's not being given the financial focus and priority that it needs to be, and I, for one, am really not happy that we are letting one person come to the board and say, do not waste your time, any more time, on a discussion of window units and focus all of the board's efforts on encouraging Governor Hogan to accelerate the state's portion of school construction. It is just absurd that we would not evaluate case by case these schools so that we could get them air conditioned sooner. I'm very disappointed and I do not want to uh, concede that there is nothing that we can do for our student athletes. I would like some more discussion about that or to have the top staff try and figure out a way that we can do something that is appropriate. Mr. Chairman. Yes, uh, Mr. Collins. Now, I know, I know uh, it's not wise or even appropriate or approved by the chair to get into a dialogue with, with a member, of, of a colleague on the board, but, so I'm going to make my comments generic. Um, I've been on the board for five plus years, and I believe we've made enormous progress in all kinds of areas of improving our system improving instruction, improving facilities, and in improving a whole lot of things and making our system better. I happen to believe when I came to the board, we were a very good system at that time. I think our previous superintendent, Dr. Joe Hairston, who's a personal friend of mine, I must admit, but who I also observed and worked with during my previous life, um, both in the General Assembly and in the current job that I hold, and as just a citizen, I think he did a wonderful job in advancing our system. When we made the decision, and I and David Uhlfelder are the only two board members that were here at the time to hire Dr. Dance, and then the rest of us made the decision uh, by a 10 to 2 vote to rehire Dr. Dance, I think we made a correct decision on both of those occasions after a great deal of thought, discussion, and study. I think we have to understand that a great deal of progress has been made. Now, has everything happened that we wanted? How many times have you heard me speaking in frustration at the slow pace of things happening at my beloved Kenwood High School? But it's going to happen there now. I mean, you know, we, we cannot, we will forever have more will than wallet. We will forever want to do more things than we have money to do. And I still say, I have a huge respect for Governor Hogan and the effort of the General Assembly, my former colleagues, and many of them are my friends to this day who are here, for County Executive Kamenetz and our County Council. They're doing an amazing job. And you know this, those of you who go to the National Convention and speak to people from other states and other areas, Maryland and Baltimore County spend an enormous amount of their budget. In Baltimore County, 54% of it goes to public schools of the entire budget. And I support that, I applaud that. But we've made enormous progress, we continue to make enormous progress. And, to, and, and, and I just want to put in, in my two cents at this point, or maybe my $22.22, uh, because I think that Maryland does a great job, Baltimore County and Governor Hogan does a great job, Baltimore County does a great job, and County Executive Kamenetz does a great job. I still say we should avoid getting ourselves involved, involved in, in disputes between those two individuals, both elected leaders by the citizens of our state and county. I don't think we belong in the middle of a fight between the two of those uh, great leaders. But having said that, I do think we should thank them both for all they have done, but we also need to acknowledge, and I'm proud of the five years I've spent on this board, five plus years, and I think we've made great progress, and I think we continue to make progress. And, and I want to tell you, those of you who remain on the board for a long time after I'm no longer here, the cup is never going to be completely full but you can spend your entire career on the board looking at the portion that's not full 
or you can be grateful for the what has been filled and you can continue to work to fill the rest of it. That's where you ought to be going and that's what you ought to be doing. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and board members for indulging me after this long discussion. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Miller? My fellow board members, we have one more opportunity to do something good tonight instead of moving backwards. I move to amend the heat closure policy to also include the following schools. Schools with non-functioning air conditioning and schools with partial air conditioning that still have general classrooms without AC. All right, there's a motion. Is there a second? I second it because I second all motions. All right, any discussion? Uh, Ms. Brett? I was just wondering if we know the number of schools that, that, that this will affect. Yeah, I asked that earlier tonight, and I believe they didn't give me an answer. We, we did. We said we were compiling that information at this time. Right, so we don't but know if, the but number. But if the board's gonna go for this, I would say the board, I would recommend the board close the entire system. It doesn't really matter how many. It is the condition that we're addressing here. So this, these schools are in the same condition as schools that don't have air conditioning. Uh, they are in schools that have non-functioning air conditioning. So it doesn't matter how many there are. It's the same condition that we're addressing. Um, and schools that have partial AC, there's still general classrooms that don't have it. So those teachers, those students are still sitting in those same conditions. So I want to provide protection for those students as well as the 28,000 currently that we uh, just addressed. Uh, Mr. Roach? Mr. Chairman, was there a second? Yes, Mr. Collins seconded. Okay. Yes. Um, first, um, the current heat policy uh, makes reference to the flexibility of principals to be able to have uh, to find alternatives for folks in schools. That's what the policy is just that right now and as amended it continues that way. Um, uh, secondly, there will be those instances and in jurisdictions where every school is uh, air conditioned, there is, uh, you know, an accommodation made for a school that doesn't have air conditioning. Just as Hawthorne Elementary School had no power, the school was closed. So, um, I, uh, I I disagree with Ann to the extent that when when it's suggested that it doesn't matter because a condition's a condition. Well, the fact is there may be one classroom, and that's removing the flexibility of a principal to then address the matter in that in that place. Um, I specifically raised this question with regard to. Um, uh, Cromwell Valley because the uh, um, the gym is not air conditioned and the fact is the principal has the flexibility to relocate students who otherwise would be in a hot gym to a cooler place in that school so uh, I don't think there's anything wrong with us gathering additional information I think it is presumptive to assume that that students are not able or, or that every school that has any air condition, uh, an air conditioned school that has a non functioning classroom air conditioner and does not have air somehow um, fits under this specific policy because we've already had what the intent is for this. So that's that's my thought on it. But there's nothing wrong with us gathering that information and reporting back. I think it's in, I think in good faith uh, we'll, we'll hear from uh, from facilities. Mr. Yeah, based upon Dr. Dan's <coughs> um, comment and and uh, in full agreement with Mr. Virch's. Uh, statements. I think that we should oppose the motion. All right. This is a forgotten population. This is a population that is not on the list to receive any funding or they're not being moved forward. They have partial AC, but there's no plans right now to complete it. And they're also not covered by the heat closure policy. So this is a population that has no remedy. Let's fix that. Okay. Ms. Williams. But if we don't know the number, we really are, I think, acting prematurely, and we really should wait, um, because it may be just as the superintendent has said, if it's that many, then he should be closing all the schools. 
Um, Ms. Clausey, I think, had a question and then I'll comment. I agree with Mr. Virch that there is already a policy in place and Dr. Dance confirmed that in the case of extreme facility situations, and I don't know the language exactly, but you can clarify for us, uh, that the principals have the opportunity to call the facilities and uh, move it up the uh, hierarchy to get that one particular school closed, as Mr. Birch pointed out that Haw Hawthorne Elementary was closed for lack of power. But what I would, so I, so I do think that those schools have a recourse um, but what I would like to see is a time frame in which the board will receive the information as to how many schools have how many classrooms so that we can understand are there schools that are on a routine basis suffering from excessive heat in the classrooms and do we need to include them in the heat closure policy. So what would be an appropriate time frame for the board to receive that information? I'll meet with staff tomorrow and I'll follow up with the board on an appropriate time. So from the, in the weekly update this week, could we get a time frame of when that information will be given to us? And then just to encourage parents at any, at any school that feel that there's a situation that is unhealthy or unsafe for the students to please call the principal and then call um, the central staff to report those conditions so that they can be, so that they can be taken care of and those students can be taken care of. So that's, those would be my recommendations. All right, uh, Mr. Collins. My recommendation is my favorite recommendation. Sit down, Romaine, good. I don't want to knock you down. When we get this information, I think we need to send it to the P PRC committee for, for example. Is that why you told me to sit up? I'm for, standing up and for, I'm exiting. For further examination and decide if this is an area that we need to have an, an additional additional heat closure policy. But I, I, think, I think in all seriousness, uh, you know, um, it's a it it could be a big deal and it needs a lot of review, and I'm mercifully not, not on that committee, and they do an amazing job, and and every time a big issue comes up that we're where we reach stalemate, as Remain knows, and so do you, the rest of you, if you follow us at all, uh, I always suggest that they that they take that they get the assignment because they do an amazing amount of work on things, all right. but I but I'm serious about that. I'm not just doing that to tease. All right. Well, we have the uh, motion on the floor. It's been seconded. At this time, I'd like to ask uh, for all those in favor of the motion that Ms. Miller has made, please raise your hand. Okay, those opposed? Okay, so that motion doesn't carry. All right. So we, um, that's our, you have a uh, comment on the? Yes. Item. Yes. <clears throat> there were uh, many, many suggestions made by constituents um, and even uh, other community leaders about we have the heat closure policy and it's in place. We need to continue the discussion of what emergency measures we can put in place to cool enough spaces in schools so that they could stay open. Um, and that students would have a safe place to go. Routinely, people use generators so that they don't need to do electrical upgrades and emergency management response equipment. In these schools that don't have air conditioning where the gyms aren't air conditioned, if we could just put air conditioning in the gyms, which could be done through a doorway, wouldn't have to be done through walls or asbestos-filled ceilings, and that could be done in a matter of days. I would like to see staff work on that. Also, I would like to make a suggestion that the calendar committee can start considering days to pull back to become instructional days. We have schools that have already missed two full days of instruction. I would suggest that we start looking in October when we know, when we have a greater hope that it will be cool and we won't have to rearrange another schedule. There is a professional develop day, development day in October and I would suggest the calendar committee start considering days that we could um, move to be from professional development to include instruction. Do I need to make a motion to have that done or is that something the chair can direct the superintendent to or is that, when is that appropriate to um, start the work with the calendar committee? The calendar committee is an ongoing uh, committee but we would have to go back to the table with our bargaining units. When, when we bring the calendar to you all, 
then we are sitting down with a large stakeholder group that takes into account items that we have in practice agreed to with our bargaining unit. So, for example, the Professional Development Day in October is actually the State Teachers Association Conference that's in Ocean City. So we, in practice, agreed with TAPCO that that would be a Professional Development Day so our teachers can attend the conference and we wouldn't have to get substitutes. So we're actually looking at a district fiscal impact if we decide to do that. So, you know, we look at uh, you know, looking at making up days throughout the year anyway. Another thing to keep in mind, too, is that because we're already at the maximum number of teacher days in our contract, some of our teachers are still working when our 37 schools are closed. If you add days to it, then you can't add just for those 37 schools. You're adding for the whole system, which is an additional fiscal impact. Then what is the suggestion, that we not try and make up the instructional time for these students? How many teachers go to the MSWA? I'm curious what the fiscal impact would be. We can get that information to you. It's MSEA, but we can get that information okay. to you. You're good. But I think that, that the board should support pursuing adding the instructional time back for these students, suggesting the calendar committee, and also continuing to work on emergency measures that we can do. Because we're still going to have, even if all of this construction takes place with with Mr. Dixit, hardworking, Mr. Kevin Smith, with no additional staff, um, that we continue working on that. And the other thing that I would really like to see is um, how many days, or a discussion to, to start, is how many days are these 37 schools going to be losing time before it would be appropriate to discuss early dismissal of all schools so that on days when it's not going to be hot excessively until later, that all schools could get to school so that these children would have the opportunity to eat their meals, get instruction, and not get continue to get behind their peers. All right. Thank you for your thoughts. Um, that's our last agenda item for this evening. I would um, like to hear other board members' comments about early dismissal and how, how many days do we feel it's appropriate for these 37 schools to miss instruction before we start making adjustments to the whole system. And also, the, the issue about the calendar committee relates back to the superintendent waivers, where typically, Dr. Dance, correct me, you've <coughs> said that the superintendents like to see the school systems make adjustments to their calendars. Ms. Cousin, you're asking questions that I, I believe if you submit your questions to me, I, I would appreciate staff and I being able to collaborate to be able to, to fully respond to the entire board. I, I would not want to answer off the cuff on some of the questions you're asking. Well, we, are, we already did. I'll just, I'll make, a yes. quick, I'll make a quick comment, Mr. Chairman. Yes, go ahead, right. Mr. Collins. We already did adjust our schedule relative to, uh, to the uh, spring break in anticipation of some of this happening. Isn't that right? That's no. Dance? The way our calendar is written, if the system misses, the entire system misses a certain number of days, and I believe, Dr. Mayo, that's five by a certain date, then we will go into spring break. It doesn't take into account the individual schools that we closed the last two days. Oh, okay. But, or Tuesday, Friday, and Monday. Oh, okay. I misunderstood that when, when we talked about it. All right. Thank you. Just to give my input um, in reaction to your, to your statement or question, I don't think... Um, it hurts the system to get a little bit of research from the transportation department to see if we can close strategically close early two or three hours early even if it's not this year when the number of schools that aren't air conditioned in the future when that number drops if we could just have some more information from the, from from um, transportation right and I, I echo that sentiment but we in all fairness I think the administration needs to be given the opportunity to gather that information and we have studied next year if we have the if we bring online which we're anticipating bringing online the number of schools with central air we will be able to close just the schools without AC half day or two hours early and still get buses back around because we can design a special route for that handful of schools that's great right. thank you thank so you this is okay. really a problem that's going to go away 16, in 17 June. school year yeah right I mean we probably spent more time on it tonight than, than it's going to take to solve it in June. All right. All right. The announcements for tonight are that uh, school is going to be closed on Monday, September 5th for Labor Day. <laughs> but it is yeah, open tomorrow. And I will mention our next board meeting is Tuesday, September 13th. And I do know that a couple board members won't be able to make it that day. So um, if you're not able to make it on September 13th, please let me know. I know about Mr. Gillis and I think Mr. Collins. There might be some other board, but you're not here on the 13th, correct? 
Yes, I, I'm, yeah, I'm not here. I'm, yes. I'm on vacation. So I just want to make sure we're represented properly uh, on that day. So uh, the meeting's now adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.